Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend, Parallel Deku, back with another fanfiction. This is the third part of, what if Deku was the only one alive? Now before starting, please give this video a like, and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. I am, Aizawa started, voice a low feral hiss as his entire body trembled, so disappointed in all of you. The class slowly looked at their feet, unable to meet his eyes out of guilt or a growing sense of frustration. Of all the goddamn things, Aizawa continued on his vent, hands curling into fists then straightening out of simply something to do. I have never taught such such. Irresponsible, Shinsu offered from his spot near the stairwell. Reckless, thick-skulled, moronic, Aizawa turned, his hair rising into a halo of deathly origin. And you, Shinsu's eyes widened, his throat moved in an ever-so-subtle gulp. Aizawa descended on him, spitting words with such venom he should have been a rattlesnake. Lift up your goddamn shirt right now. Shinsu stared back and did not lift his shirt. Bro, Kaminari choked up, unable to stop the guilty tears that leaked from the corner of his eyes. Don't don't do it. Just, I'm sorry. Shinsu deadpanned flatly, his tone warbling ever so slightly. But you're not my real dad. Aizawa's face twitched like breaking bone. It's not just a phase. Shinsu continued, lifting his chin wobbly as he powered through towards his imminent doom. You don't understand me. I am this close. Aizawa spoke in a whisper to legally adopting you. So I can kick your butt so strong, and nobody can say anything. Shinsu stiffened, frozen in true horror. It's not child abuse. Aizawa continued like the whispering wind trickling through gravestones. If I'm a registered physical education teacher, it's called punishment. Shinsu trembled. Aizawa descended. Lift up your goddamn shirt, Shinsu. Shinsu lifted his shirt and exposed the evidence of Mina's handiwork a poorly done DIY belly button piercing, already swollen like a black eye. Aizawa inhaled slowly and held it. Nobody breathed. The front door opened, present Mike peeking in with a wide grin that faltered once he read the atmosphere. Azashi, Aizawa spoke, voice louder to be heard even though the entire dorm was deathly silent. Get me Shinsu Hitoshi's adoption papers. Now, new plan, Mina spoke, standing firmly in the middle of the kitchen. Shinsu hadn't returned. The look of horror on the purple-haired boy's face was so poignant. Kaminari felt the nausea twist in his own skin. That narcoleptic caterpillar isn't going to stop us. You realize, Momo spoke politely from the side, that I have the power to stop you at any point. No, no ponytail don't do sit. Bakugu hollered, clutching his gut wheezing with laughter over it all. Let them be FC King stupid. That's the spirit. Mina beamed, raising one fist in the air. I don't know how Sensei found out about the fabulous Mina piercing studio. Probably because you talk about it all the time. Gyro offered with a small smirk. The only one who managed to get away unscathed in the great purge of piercings. Like, I'm surprised Midnight isn't showing up. Mina pouted, that's not all I can do. Momo, do you have the legal handbook for UA? Of course I do. Momo blinked in surprise, pulling the exact handbook from her nearby bag, doesn't everyone? I'm not going to even offer that an answer. Mina chirped, plucking the book as she instantly searched the dress code section. You got any leads? Kaminari asked quietly, still haunted by Aizawa's BLD red eyes locked on his horribly done nose piercing. TCH, Bakugu had a smirk, sharp tooth and bright-eyed, boy. Raccoon face. What? She glanced over her shoulder, blinking curiously. Bakugu's grin didn't falter. You know how to do that nail sit. Aizawa clutched the podium, trying to still his heart. You didn't. He spoke, voice a hoarse crackling whisper of horror. You didn't. Many eyes blinked at him curiously, some more innocent than others. Aizawa pulled his phone, sent a single text to Midnight requesting she cover for him, and sat down. He stared at the chalkboard where nothing was written, and refused to look at the mess of his students. Nobody said anything, which made it partially worse. The door opened and Midnight slipped in, taking one casual glimpse over the students, then a second, then a sharp inhale that mirrored Aizawa's current mental state. Oh my god. Midnight spoke, blinking in amazement and delight. Oh my god who did this to you? Kirishima lifted one hand Midnight couldn't look away from the long acrylic nails glued to his fingers. ELD red, poorly trimmed and styled, except for the goddamn points on them. The fake nails must have been half as long as each of his goddamn fingers. Midnight felt her hair curl at the sight of such such crudely done manicure. Technically we aren't breaking the rules. Kirishima offered guiltily. But ah, uh, Aizawa sensei hasn't said anything since class started and we're kinda worried over him. Takoyami nodded with his neon collection of feathers woven into his plumage. He looked like a crudely done dye job. Except feathers. He stank like cheap quality LTX glue. Midnight felt like taking a seat next to Aizawa. Give her a moment, Mina whispered, and Midnight sunk to the floor. No, she whispered, flinching away, no, have mercy. Ah, Kaminari nodded sympathetically, she's seen the crocs. Every student was wearing poorly bedazzled crocs with glitter. 
Bakugu's crocs had little grenade foam pins. Hey, Bakugu sneered at her. In his eyes, Midnight could tell he was just as pained as she was. They glow in the FC King dark. You have henna. Midnight spoke. She couldn't hear herself speak. You all have henna. Everywhere. To CH. Bakugu snorted. Like those sits could FC King draw. You hear. I did the FC King henna. He's really good at it. Ajiro admitted calmly. His tail hair was woven into plastic gaudy beads. This can't get worse. Midnight said, staring at the floor because this was class 1A. Of course it could get worse. She just wasn't ready for it. Mina broke into giggles. And all eyes traveled to Sato. This is what killed Aizawa. Kirishima beckoned, his long nails far too horrifying to not look at. So a uh, fair warning. Midnight had seen many things in her life. She was not ready. Sato sighed and tugged his student uniform shirt open. Sato was a large student. Apparently he had developed a thin dark fuzz layer of CH scent hair which was a fair bit unusual. Midnight flinched away, skittering on her hands to get away. Number one Dezawa was shaved into Sato's CH scent hair, in the shape of a heart. Somewhere under the desk, Aizawa whimpered. Nobody really mentioned it, but sometimes the fact that one was unfortunate came to light. Sometimes it was only vague comments, other times it was a slight reference from strangers. It wasn't like most students were easily recognizable Midoriya being so plain on average he rarely ever noticed the comment. Todoroki was well used to whispers and staring eyes, he grew up with it. It didn't matter now that whenever anyone thought of him, they remembered the giant wall of ice he displayed at the sports tournament or the headlines and passing of students being attacked. Out of everyone in the entire class, it was Bakugu that suffered. Thankfully, his will of iron was enough to literally club someone over the head for daring to imply he wasn't good enough or anything of that sort. It didn't stop the fact that when someone thought of Bakugu, they saw him attacking Uraraka viciously. They saw him covered in chains and muzzled. They thought of him kidnapped in a public ordeal, or even in headlines over being an innocent victim in the sludge villain fiasco. Sometimes in passing, Asui would hear a student from the year above jokingly laughing about how danger-prone class 1A was. Sometimes Ajiro would spot a few general studies mocking Bakugu for his vicious temper. Shinsu knew the general study students more than anyone, but even he wouldn't admit that the idea of making fun of Yue almost always equated to Bakugu Katsuki. At this point, the blonde teen was practically the unofficial spokesperson for the entire academy. Sometimes, it didn't help to be recognized. Oof, Mina started, leaning over to try and get a better look from her desk. Looks like Blasty has a shiner. Siro squinted before pointedly looking at Kirishima. As subtle as they could, the group investigated Midoriya, who seemed to be looking fine. That was odd. Normally whenever Bakugu had some sort of injury Deku matched him. Bro, Kirishima tried, reaching out to prod the blonde teen. Bakugu glared from the side of his eyes, eyes livid enough from above the darkened bruise that Kirishima gave up instantly. Nobody mentioned the bruise on Bakugu's face he likely had gotten in a fight with someone. Or maybe he challenged the third years again. It would only be a matter of time until Bakugu stopped threatening every hero student in sight with his fist. Since you all have been stupid, once again. Aizawa started, sounding far too exhausted. And recovery girl has gone on strike against class 1A. We will not be conducting hero training. Kirishima argued, Kaminari protesting wordlessly. Even Yuraka gasped in disappointment, Todoroki frowning visibly. You should have all considered this, before you purchase Crocs. Aizawa droned, his eyes flashing red to show how truly PSS he was over that. This is punishment. SCK it up. Shinsu from his seat, slunk slower down. The bags under his eyes were surprisingly darker, perhaps just shy of charcoal. Actually, Aizawa said, I changed my mind. You're all doing essays. Do on Monday. What? No. Sensei have mercy please. No mercy here. Aizawa didn't blink. You didn't give me any. Eight-page paper. Minimum. Momo sighed and looked down at her desk, already feeling her plans for visiting that nearby yoga studio fade away. What topic, sensei? Ada asked professionally. Aizawa looked over them all, gaze not staying on any individual for longer than a few seconds. His fingers tapped on the table, a boring tapping rhythm. Insurance companies. Aizawa's eyes were filled with vindictive glee, and city taxes for infrastructure damage. Bakugu choked, a soft quiet noise. Momo was frozen, staring at her desk in disbelief. This was, going to be strong, for everyone. It was already established that Kaminari would be failing. At most it would be days of stress. Anjiro sighed, his tail sagging as Hagakure collapsed on her desk heavily. Midoriya looked green, well, greener. And, Aizawa added, at least two sources. Stinky BSDRD man. Shinsu whispered quietly under his breath. Is this because of the crocs? Jiro asked, looking up from her thick textbook of mortgage rates in the city. It's almost certainly because of the crocs, Momo replied, her voice hoarse and sore, as tired as she felt. I liked them. Shinsu offered quietly, sticking around by working on his essay on his laptop, sitting against the door frame. The door frame was only half the width of his back, 
but he didn't seem uncomfortable with the position. Really brought out the color of my eye bags. Your eye bags could fuel a furnace, Gyro muttered, turning the page of her book tiredly. I can't believe this all started because of a piercing. Momo huffed and shifted in her seat. I, I think Sensei was, overreacting. We were all being clean and sterile and, that man, Shinsu said, his voice a low offended tone, deserves no love. Did he actually adopt you? Gyro asked, not expecting an answer anyways. I just think he did too much. Momo argued quietly. I think it was dot 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 too much. Momo huffed and hunched her back, curling over her assignment a little more. Gyro very slowly began to grin. Though, you thought the Mina piercing studio was okay. Momo scowled darkly, her hair falling around her face. She was getting stress acne from this DMN paper. I just think he thought we weren't being intelligent about it. It was, kinda offensive. We dot 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 we aren't kids, we're all allowed to get piercings. Generally you have to be 18. Shinsu offered dryly, but we signed a waiver for the hero course which basically gave us legal permission for most things besides alcohol and tattoos. Momo slowly looked up, staring at Shinsu with an unreadable expression. We did sign that, didn't we? Oh no, Gyro said, trying to withhold a surprised burst of laughter. Momo, you're looking a bit crazy. I'm not crazy, Momo said. I'm just very stressed, and apparently very petty. Shinsu's grin was far too wide, and far too tired. Want me to get Mina? Yes. Momo nodded determined. We don't have to turn this in until Monday. And he's not giving us any training because of this anyways. That should be enough time for swelling to go down. Gyro's mouth dropped into a wordless circle of amusement. Oh my god. Oh my god you have a backbone. Pardon my language. Momo's brow scrunched and her nose twitched. SSHD's going to get crazy. Oh my god. Gyro said. I love you. Mina twirled on her stool, tapping her fingers casually together. Her hair was tied back with a headband and bobby pins. Her nails recently painted. I see you have a dilemma. Mina hummed, blinking slowly. I'm doing this to be dramatic. You know I'm totally in on this. We know. Gyro snickered, feeling fairly comfortable in Mina's bright fuzzy room. You in on this? Oh, totally. Mina beamed. You've researched enough. Most of everything is made out of surgical steel. Momo nodded slowly. I've also researched into the actual piercing supplies. Oh sweet. Mina grinned, teeth on display. Yeah, I've had a ton of piercings but my acid chewed through the clamps. I know how to do this, no worries. Epic. Gyro confirmed. Want me to set up the girls' washroom so we don't have to do this in the kitchen again like the back alley of a gas station? Gyro, you're the bakugu. Mina nearly giggled. Get it? Like you're the bomb. Gyro CLC kept her tongue and managed finger guns as she padded her way to the communal girl washroom. Normally the girl washrooms were a mess in the finest way. Makeup everywhere. Clothing hanging on the towel racks from spot cleaning only. Soap. So much soap that nobody actually used. There were bobby pins on the floor and Gyro swore they multiplied. She started clearing off the counter, moving some of the products and brushes to have a nice table workspace. Cleaning it and sanitizing was basic stuff. Momo gave her a look of gratitude as she and Mina shuffled in, holding a small jewelry box. So, I'm thinking you can look at a few of what I have to figure out the colors and designs. Mina offered, flipping the lid to the dozens of little earrings that she had. Momo picked up one of the small hoops, spinning it to look at the little stud. This isn't harder than anything else I've used in training. I can make you something stronger than surgical steel, acid resistant. You're the best. Ashida looked ready to cry. I'm going to go tell Kaminari that the piercing studio is back in operation. Gyro's smile started to falter. Where did Shinsu go? The first time the Mina piercing studio was open for business, they were using piercings that were roughly crude, wedges of apple, and cotton ass. Now, oh now they were living like kings. Industrial clamps, hollow needles, surgical steel and titanium bars to accommodate the swelling until it went down. Hell, they were ready with ice from the freezer and small baggies to help any soreness. This is the best idea I've ever had, Momo stated calmly, using a small mirror to smile at her new piercing small silver studs in her earlobes. She was nearly vibrating at the idea of wearing small hoops sometime. Look, Ashido pointed at the small little studs on her ears, towards the top of her cartilage. I can get hoops that match my horns. Guys, I look amazing. Gyro poked her nose, smiling at the tiny stud behind one nostril. Not so bad yourself Kaminari. Kaminari beamed, sticking out his tongue. It was already starting to swell, but he had learned a long while ago that the only bit of metal that was safe when he used his quirk was the inside of his mouth. I didn't honestly think that so many people would be curious. Mina shrugged, holding her clamps carefully as she finished off Ajiro's one piercing a tiny little stud that Kirishima promised him looked manly. Why not? Kirishima gasped, eyeing his reflection adoringly. I look so manly now. Look at me. Kaminari slurred something. Impossible to hear behind the CLC king of metal on teeth. This is kind of fun. Momo flushed slightly. Is dot 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 is it normally this? Fun. Breaking the rules. We've infected you. 
Siro snickered, playing with the small studs in his tragis. It gets more fun. Impossible. Momo instantly denied. No, it does. Mina said. We still haven't grabbed Midoriya yet. Oh my god. Jairo whispered, eyes watering with her effort of withholding laughter. Guys, I can't handle this. He hasn't stopped crying once. Hiroraka chewed on her lower lip. Oh, you mean Ida. Look at him. Jairo squeaked, a single tear escaping in her effort to remain composed. He has a FC King belly ring. Hiroraka tilted her head. I think it's kinda cute. I mean, it doesn't suit him at all, but it's kinda nice he's trying this class bonding thing. Kaminari slurred something impossible to hear around his swollen tongue. Midoriya in the corner continued to cry, it wasn't his fault. It was mostly an instinctive body reaction. But it sure was impressive how much water he had stored in his tear ducts. I think it makes you look cute, Deku. Hiroraka offered with a thumbs up. Midoriya, wobbly with snot dripping from his nose, offered a weak thumbs up in response, his ear already swollen with the tiny helix piercing looping around his outer ear. It must have been Momo's rebellious spirit and Ada's enthusiasm, because the next thing Mina knew she was practicing dermal piercings on lumps of skin Shoji constructed for her to practice on the wonderful guy only twitched slightly as she slowly practiced over and over. Do you want one? Mina asked, biting her lower lip nervously. Shoji paused in thought, then pointed to his nose. Ooh, Mina lit up like a firework, across your bridge. Are you sure? He shrugged, I heal really easy anyways. Fair enough. Mina started, fishing around for one of the double-sided laminated papers that Momo had prepared. So, before I do this I wanna run through exactly what you gotta do to keep this clean and safe. Takoyami and Koda glanced at the small dermals, embedded under their skin right where it turned soft near their collarbones. Okay, so these things have a huge chance of rejection. Mina's face was deathly serious. If this seems like it's a bit weird, you let me know ASAP, you two got it. I'll paint your nails and give you a weave anytime. But you gotta promise me you'll let me know if anything bad happens. Koda gave a thumbs up. Takoyami recited poetry. The door was kicked open. All eyes jerked up in states of terror. You sitheads were having a party without me. Bakugu screamed, stomping in with a scowl. Bakugu stared, his eyes sliding over the collection of people. Truly, a party. Momo and Jiro in charge. SCRT people to Mina who was looking only slightly like a serial killer. Ajiro looking guilty, Ayama fawning over his reflection. Deku still sobbing in the corner clutching his ear. You're stabbing people, Bakugu said, slowly articulating the words, and you didn't invite me. Mina very carefully put the needle in her hands down. I am not piercing your junk. Bakugu rolled his eyes. Deku choked and nearly died. Here you little sit. Bakugu grumbled, using one finger to demonstrate an industrial piercing, straight through the top of his ear in a single bar. You mess this up, I'll F seeking inside out you like taking off skinny jeans. You're such a poet. Mina muttered, disinfecting and using a pen to carefully place dots where needed. Truly, you were born in the wrong era. You realize that I'm not a professional at this, right? Stab me you pink-eyed rake. Bakugu sneered. The door opened. Shinsu was smiling like something far too proud. Hey guys, Shinsu nearly purred. Theoretically, you would say that what we're doing PSS off a father figure, correct? The class, shoved into the tiny washroom stared at him blankly. Didn't your FC King dad beat your butt enough? Bakugu deadpanned. The door swung open forward. Todoroki stomped in with a composed expression of a marble bust. He sat on Mina's chair, pointedly ignoring the steadily rising excitement and disbelief of the room. No way. Jairo whispered, practically squealing. This is going to be good. Kaminari tried to say. Instead, he gargled. I heard this is an acceptable form of rebellion. Todoroki said. It is. Momo very slowly agreed. Pierce his junk. Bakugu cackled. Shinsu's smile didn't fall, which left Mina nearly breaking into a cold sweat. Shinsu, Mina started unsure. What did you tell him? I want to give Endeavor an aneurysm. Todoroki said, pierce my ass. Bakugu laughed so strong, he cried. It turned out his tears were also nitroglycerin. Aizawa stared at his coffee in silent thought. What's up with you? Hazashi asked him, leaning against the counter with his own cup of coffee. Do you ever feel, Aizawa said quietly, that your students have made a terrible decision in your absence? Nah, no, Hizashi snickered, sipping his coffee, but then again, those students are practically your kids and this is teenage rebellion at its finest. Good God. Aizawa whispered, Midoriya is going to break so many bones. It wasn't Midoriya this time. <laughs> Soba, Mina cheered, leading the small chain of people as the group left campus, sticking to the sidewalks in various forms of civilian clothing. Soba, Todoroki, looking vaguely sickened and pained all morning, looked distinctly pleased with the direction of where the day ended up going. You like Soba, right? Midoriya asked, bumping one hand into Todoroki's side. Yes, Todoroki confessed with an unusual display of longing. I love Soba. You said it. Kirishima cheered, pumping his fist. 
Bakugu rolled his eyes. CLC King has tongue sourly as he actually had the directions for the soba place Mina had found. The sidewalks were nice and open despite the small crowd. It was a nice day outside, but the majority of people tended to go more in the city for food. The outskirts were completely fine, but the buildings were filled with offices and other corporations. It was surprising that the soba place was parked in the middle of high-end professionalism, but even marketing agents had to eat during lunch. Oh it smells so good. Mina could barely contain herself, wriggling in excitement. I want a bowl all to myself. A huge one. Oh, remember to bring some back for Kami. Shinsu too, Midoriya added. It was nice of him to stay back to watch over him. Very manly. Kirishima's smile was so wide, his joy was contagious. The soba place was small, but clearly used to a large swarm of hungry individuals. The kitchen staff and hostess barely blinked at the group of loud students, directing them to a half-circle booth seat in the back. I'm so amazed they have a table big enough for us. Mina slid down the back, sprawling herself across the vinyl backing. Todoroki blinked and did a quick head count. There's only six of us. No, there's five of us. Then whatever Blasty is, Mina teased, ignoring the barely withheld screaming directed at her face. Soba came, and although it seemed quite amazing to Midoriya, Todoroki looked a little upset with it. Biraraka wasn't one to turn down free food, which quickly caught everyone's eye as she smoothly demolished an entire bowl of cold soba. Kirishima naturally challenged her to an eating contest. Midoriya, cheering on Yuraraka, didn't last long as Bakugu vehemently threw himself into cheering on Kirishima. Mina took her place as the referee, shouting penalties that did nothing as Bakugu's trash talk quickly devolved into a collection of adjectives accompanied by a random noun. The hostess, in her tired young adult willpower, barely reacted to the scene. Would you like desert? She asked, speaking plainly even though Todoroki was the only one able to hear her over Midoriya's frantic backpedaling and Bakugu's rapid verbatim move. He was throwing in adverbs now, clever boy. Yes, Todoroki told her, accepting the small pleather book to browse the selection available. Deku you nervous uptight pickle face dingo breath ketchup stain. Kakan I don't even know what you said. Hey, your goddamn ears broken you scrawny green haired. Yes, Todoroki looked back at the hostess, I'd like some of the ice cream. The waitress withheld a yawn, and ignored how spoons were now being used as deadly weapons by the majority of the table. In a cone or a bowl, Todoroki's brow furrowed in thought. His glass of water was commandeered by the military power of Uravity, to be thrown in Kirishima. Your teeth look like a shark so here's some tasty air. As face, a bowl please. Todoroki passed back the menu. Sure thing. She nodded, stepping around the puddle on the floor. The waitress didn't come back with the ice cream. Instead, she screamed from inside the kitchen. It was almost like the group of students had been strong-wired to respond to screams. Because screaming could almost always be anything, but most of the time it ended up being a situation where Midoriya broke his bones. Everyone tensed. Eyes fell curd to Midoriya. Maybe it was a rat. Yuraraka offered weakly, staring at the doors towards the kitchen. It was suspiciously silent now. Fat of seeking chance. Bakugu roared, throwing himself over the table, right over Kirishima's head to land on the ground. Midoriya stood quickly. His chair quietly clattered to the floor in a much less dramatic display. Kakin. You don't have your permit. FCK that. Bakugu screamed, kicking the door to the kitchen open with his hands half curled into fists. Spark snapped quietly, like the sound of Kirishima's skin sharpening along the back of his arms. Nobody was in uniform, but it didn't stop them. Midoriya burst into the kitchen just after Kirishima barreled past, skin protruding and strong to deflect any threats. Yuraraka followed in pace with Deku, Todoroki and Mina opting to stay out in the dining area for distance cover. Yuraraka's eyes scanned the kitchen, the huddled chefs under the tables and out of harm's way. Hey, what happened? She asked, rushing to the closest kitchen aid. Bakugu didn't wait to unscramble the stuttered response. Instead he ran and barreled through the emergency kitchen exit into the accompanying alley. Kak and wait, Deku shouted, grimacing as the blonde didn't listen. Don't worry bro, I'm on it, Kirishima said, running after. The kitchen staff was bumbling over words, clearly shaken. Yuraraka no, Yuravity, was frowning as she tried to understand the important bits in the middle of the hysteric babbling. Don't worry, you'll be okay. Yuravity consoled the man, I'll have one of my partners call the police right away. You said Amory Sen was taken out back. She met eyes with Deku, and gave a nod. Deku ran, small sparks of green power flashing as he chased in hot pursuit. Pinky, Yuravity elevated her voice. Both Pinky and Shadow entered the kitchen on alert. Can you call the police? The waitress, Amory Rikako is her name and she was taken out the back. Deku, Red Riot and Dot Dot Dada are in pursuit. Right, Pinky nodded, fishing for her personal phone, typing quickly into the villain hotline. Did you notice what the villain's quirk was? Shouto asked calmly, approaching the staff who were beginning to come out from hiding. Something brown, augmentation. 
The staff shuddered, came out of the drain and awe, attacked Amory Chan. It's okay. Gravity beamed. Are you okay here now? Yes, thank you. The kitchen seemed grateful, so the three bolted after their companions. It was easy to find the trail. Either the small scuff marks on the ground and tipped over trash cans, or the small indentations Deku left behind his reinforced jumps. It was impressive how much distance was covered in such a short time. But after a city block the sounds of a scuffle were loud. The first thing Pinky realized was that the louder shouts of a struggle were not female. The second thing she realized was the waitress, Amory San, was clearly unconscious on the sidewalk. Gravity, Pinky shouted, pointing at the woman. Gravity instantly ran over, testing the standard protocol for health evaluations. Pinky ran further down the road. Noticing distantly that Uravity was moving the woman to a safer location she must have been fine other than being unconscious. The alley was marked with trash cans and scorch marks a bad sign considering Bakugu wasn't legally allowed to use his quirk. Shadow raced alongside her, skidding to a halt with a sharp inhalation of surprise. It was easy to see why. The villain was. A blob. A shapeless mass of something dark green or dark brown with a bubbling liquid texture. Thick and gelatinous, yet somehow somehow familiar. Mina was positive she had seen this villain before, or a similar quirk. Deku was standing his ground, a half-hunched position next to Kirishima who was looking more petrified than fearsome. Deku, Mina shouted, swallowing thickly before forcing herself to move forward. Stand aside. Deku didn't, so Mina shoved past and flexed her arms and released a large globule of acid. It sizzled in the air like a carbonated pop, bubbling on contact with the viscous villain. No, Kirishima shouted, looking ready to tackle her. You can't. It's got Kakin. Deku croaked out, looking pale and haunted although Mina couldn't quite understand why. I, I can't kick him or I'll hit Kakin. I can't charge. Tirashima snarled, nearly spitting with the level of his intensity. That BSD already doesn't have anything to hit. What? Mina gasped, blinking wide eyes as the mixture near them kept shifting, wait, like, and that. Yeah. Deku croaked. Todoroki's face darkened and he shifted his stance, tensing ever so slightly. Ice exploded and blunted spikes straight into the mass. It flowed, oozing around them, although it allowed a gap ever so slightly. Mina felt her heart chill as the BLD curdling shrieks and swears were let loose, finally exposed to the air. A heady smell off dot 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 wet wood roasting wafted free of something burning and extinguishing over and over again. There was no doubt that inside the mass, Bakugu was thrashing. Todoroki swore, grimacing as he realized the dilemma. Any ice he sent would pierce straight through and threaten to impale Bakugu instead. Oh God. Midoriya moaned, swaying slightly with his rapidly paling face. I I don't know what I. Deku, Hiroraka shouted, running into the alley, eyes a fell see curring over the scene. Her face settled in a grimace, ripping out her phone to throw at Todoroki. Call Sensei. She yelled, racing forward, Pinky. We need to get him some breathing room. On it, Mina shouted, gathering more acid to chuck. The body of the villain wasn't limitless, so with enough quick swipes and jabs, and enough corrosive acid, they could theoretically whittle down until Bakugu could be freed. They'd have to be careful not to hit Bakugu, sticking only to the extremities. It was easy to see why Deku and Red Riot couldn't fight. He's on his way, Todoroki shouted, watching everything with a highly anxious twist of his mouth. Pinky and Uravity kept working, kept swiping to separate little bubbles of floating slime and burning through the outer layers. Something changed in the relentless effort, but the two girls knew better than to assume it was due to them. They could see minor changes, differences in colors, areas that bubbled violently before shrinking, bulging uncontrollably. The massive villain shrieked, a high-pitched inhuman noise as it thrashed, wriggling violently and fighting some sort of battle that the others couldn't help. Over and over, more violently than before, the villain threw itself at the wall of the alley, smashing forcefully against brick. It pulled back and smashed again, sounding like wet clay on the floor. Midoriya paled further, looking ready to faint. The brick wall was getting a noticeable small dent. Bakugu, Tirashima screamed, body vibrating in the agony of being unable to do anything. Bakugu, come on man. Deku was barely responding, whispering in a constant mumble not again not again oh god please not again. The villain shrieked, curving in and out, flexing and undulating. The top portion of the mass exploded, rupturing like a volcano. Again and again, violent explosions much larger than Bakugu would use against a person. As large as small bus, over and over, the alley was stinking of wet charred something. More thrashing and wordless screaming that felt so different compared to all of Bakugu's screams before. They sounded nightmarish, terrified on a primal animal level infused with pure rage. It was jarring. Mina wasn't sure she'd be able to forget the sounds even in her sleep. Get back. Someone shouted behind them, a distant background noise in the wake of it all. She distantly noticed someone new, a larger body and something pushing her out of the way. Oh, she said, realizing that it was all over, that Aizawa-sensei had arrived. It had felt like forever. Get out of here. 
Aizawa shouted at them again. Unable to turn due to his activated quirk, Mina felt someone grab her arm and tug her out of the alley towards where the distant sounds of sirens were drawing closer. Midoriya looked just as shaken as they were gently led away by Todoroki and Yuraka. Aizawa had expected his students to do something stupid, something so aggravatingly stupid, he should have known better to ever presume such a thing. He didn't let his quirk stop even as he slowly kneeled on the ground, his knees staining with fluid he didn't want to think about. Bakugu was pale, eyes distant and unresponsive, breathing uncontrolled. Already his lips were turning blue. Bakugu. He tried. Unresponsive, just as he assumed. Aizawa reached out so slowly, fingers skimming the exposed portion of Bakugu's shirt. Bakugu flinched back, a small wordless whimper mixed with a snarl. Aizawa exhaled controlled through his nose. He hadn't anticipated his weekend to go like this. What did you do? He thought exhaustively to himself. A moment of deliberation. He activated his quirk on the muddy residue on the ground. Then he looked away quickly, trying not to feel nauseated by the carnage. Bakugu, he said, slowly louder as he tried to get through to the team. Bakugu, we need to move. Bakugu. Bakugu didn't respond. Aizawa activated his quirk despite his eyes watering and forcefully gripped his student's shoulder. Another snarl, a flexing of muscles as explosions raged against his own abilities. A moment of clarity, and Aizawa's grip relaxed slightly. Bakugu, he said, successful finally. We need to move. Is that okay with you? Bakugu didn't speak, only gave the vaguest of nods which in all honestly wasn't much a sign of consent. The sirens were getting closer, and Aizawa did not want his student to be in the middle of this. He was thankful he had the foresight to tell both Yuraka and Todoroki to get back to campus and not talk to any officials. He'd have to somehow piece together what happened and salvage the situation, somehow. Bakugu was shaking under his hand, small trembles like the rattling of a tree in a great wind. Let's go, Aizawa shushed him, gently guiding the silent teen out of the alley through the back. It was distressing, for the explosive individual to be rendered mute so quickly. Nonverbal was never a good sign, normally accompanied by shock. The adrenaline would be wearing off soon, quickly followed by an emotional drop. Aizawa was lucky he had been out eating dinner when he got the call, otherwise he wouldn't have had a car available. Mimuri glanced out from her conservative car, eyebrows furrowed in concern. She was good company for dinner. Generally conversation was made up of insulting popular news events. Now though, she was a welcome understanding relief compared to Hazashi's loud concern. My apartment. Aizawa grunted. Carefully SCRT the still shaken Bakugu into the back seat. Quietly, we want to avoid attention. The alley didn't have any cameras, and Aizawa knew how to handle curious police investigations. Sure, Mimuri said, shifting her car into gear to merge back onto the road. It was a short amount of time via car but felt forever as the pressure of an imminent heart-to-heart -heart setting. For God's sake, he already had enough of these with Shinsu. Take a seat, Aizawa sighed, unraveling his capture weapon to string up near the door. The convenience of his capture weapon looking like a normal scarf was how he could wear it in public easy. When Aizawa glanced over, Bakugu was sitting on the edge of his couch, next to the smaller chair that normally his cat stole. The cat in question was hiding somewhere out of sight. All right, Aizawa said to himself, trying to summon the confidence and effort of the conversation. He walked over, plopped down on the cat fur-laden chair, and rested his hands on his knees. Bakugu, I need you to tell me what happened. Nothing, Aizawa didn't think he'd be getting a response anyways. It was unfortunate that this had happened again to this student. If Aizawa ever thought Midoriya was the danger magnet, oh no, not at all. I know your record. I'm sorry that you had to deal with that particular villain again. Aizawa paused, trying to ignore the guilt that rested heavily in his stomach. He won't be troubling you again. He's dead. Bakugu made a noise, a sharp inhalation that shifted easily into a ragged sob of horror. He sagged forward Aizawa's arms shot out to catch his student. It's okay, he soothed. It wasn't your fault. It was self-defense. You didn't mean to hurt you. Hey. Bakugu choked off, trembling. He both shied away from Aizawa's hands and also subconsciously leaned into it. Touch starved. Wonderful. Well, Aizawa thought guiltily. This is going to be a while. It took a while for Bakugu to come back into awareness, a shocking revelation for the normally angry teen. Aizawa figured that the boy was long overdue for a breakdown anyways. Along with his craving for physical contact and touch aversion, Aizawa found himself in the very awkward placement of slinging one arm over the teen's shoulder to pull him into his side. He never was the paternal type, but God forbid anyone hurt one of his students. Bakugu wasn't doing well with the revelation that he was, once again, targeted. Aizawa also learned that his most powerful student apparently was under the assumption that he was inexplicably weak. At least, that's what society had said over and over again. Other people don't define you, Aizawa said. I know that it seems like what they say matters, but it doesn't. They don't know sit. Bakugu twitched, body in contrast to the emotions he was aggressively choking down. 
They don't, Aizawa agreed. Yet sometimes we find ourselves straining to hear the praise in other people. Just because unfortunate things have happened to you, doesn't mean you're doomed to live that way forever. People won't forget this, and the public will draw up every bit of your dirty laundry. But one day you're going to realize it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Bakugu defended. Aizawa sighed through his nose softly. Then why were you crying? Bakugu hunkered lower, small pops like firecrackers as his tears of goddamn course were also nitroglycerin. You're okay here, Aizawa repeated, tightening his arms slightly around the team. You're safe here. You're one of the strongest students I've ever had. You're completely safe here. Bakugu broke down, because after a while, carrying burdens always broke you somehow. I Bakugu trembled, flinching and clawing at his exposed skin. I that FC Kerr was violated. Aizawa realized with a low seething rage. His student was violated. What would help? Aizawa asked understanding. Bakugu shuddered, a low whine as his hands contorted and twisted. I, I have a shower you can use. Aizawa offered softly. Think about what would help. Anything within reason. Okay. Bakugu said. This, Aizawa said abruptly, is barely within reason. Aizawa completely understood of course, although it wasn't something for him. Hazashi was similar, confessing that when he was younger he was forced to wear quirk muffling devices. It was logical and he wasn't mad, but there was something incredibly invasive and violating about it all. Something that left its marks imprinted on his head. So he imprinted his own will on his arms with decorative tattoos. Bakugu seal seek at his tongue, looking significantly better even with unspiked hair. The shower had brought color back into his skin, more light into his eyes. I wasn't going to trust that watermelon-faced beach to do this. The tattoo parlor worker scolded him, carrying the needle very carefully to line up the marks. I am still furious with Ashido over that. Aizawa deadpan, trying not to wince in distaste as the thick needle pierced through Bakugu's flesh, just through his left eyebrow. What is it with my students finding an absurd fascination with body modification all of a sudden? And I see that earring. Bakugu didn't look chastised. He shrugged and accepted the thin drop of BLD from the new curved barbell along his face. Hell if I know. I'm doing it because it's my goddamn choice. No city but FC Kerr can take that away from me. I can support that. Aizawa accepted. I cannot support my students stabbing another like prison gangs. Bakugu didn't laugh, but something about his expression was very, very devious. Oh my god. Aizawa thought, staring at his students with resignation of a dead man. Everyone, every single goddamn student had some sort of metal embedded in their skin. Everyone, are you? Aizawa stopped talking before his voice cracked. Midoriya. Midoriya shrunk, the little stud in his ear impossible to miss. Bakugu of course, was laughing so strong it was a miracle he could breathe. Todoroki, completely blank-faced, stared at Aizawa. You didn't. Aizawa said. Todoroki picked up his phone, pressed a few buttons, and set it down. Almost instantly, the device started to ring from a collar. Under Todoroki's uniform, two lights were flashing. Aizawa made a noise that sounded suspiciously like a sob. The class roared in delight, looking at the blank-faced Todoroki in absolute glee. You're a monster, Kaminari howled. My apologies, Todoroki deadpanned. Not looking at the two flashing lights on his torso, it appears I'm getting a call. Shinsu, Aizawa wheezed, the words incomprehensible. Shinsu didn't look up, although he did stick out his tongue. He had a tongue piercing as well, a large charm that was that was not appropriate. Bite me, daddy, and cursive studded through his tongue. Aizawa was resigning that FC King Day. Aizawa walked into a disaster. Granted, every day tended to be some sort of disaster and already he had made a morning ritual of taking painkillers before heading to campus. But still, the room looked normal at first glance, but each of his students had a strange expression. Glee, delight, vindictive satisfaction, and regret. Already, Aizawa was contemplating leaving. Tajiro was rubbing his shoulder, a small grimace on his face. At first glance, the only thing that Aizawa could think of was that somehow the student had been injured. They weren't scheduled for training that day, and hadn't any the day before. What is going on? Aizawa asked. Aiza fell seekering to a guilty-looking Momo. She shifted on her feet, chewing her lip. Before she could explain, a swift change of movement drew Aizawa's eye. Pink skin, moving in a blur. Ashido was lunging at Koda. Tag. Ashido screeched, lips pulled back in a competitive snarl. Koda flinched, paling in horror as she tapped his shoulder non to gently. Koda, much to Aizawa's disbelief, spun around with a small eep and decked Takoyami in the face. What? Aizawa said. Takoyami spun out, tripping over the leg of a desk. He managed to grab someone's leg Hagakir from the sound of it, who screeched in dismay. A quirk, sir. Momo sighed, shoulders lowering as she hunkered in on himself. It dot 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 from what I've gathered, it must be similar to Shinsu Kun's, some sort of tactile brain control that jumps from user to user. Aizawa had never heard of a quirk like that. Normally such things required the owner of the quirk to be nearby. This sort of quirk hopping seemed more like 
A contagious disease. They've been passing it around since I got here. Ajiro added in helpfully. I think they're using it more as an excuse to punch each other. Kaminari passed it with a low swipe to Midoriya. Midoriya squeaked, bolting urgently to pass it along. Ashido clipped Uraraka's shoulder. Uraraka attacked Ida from above. Ida, much to his credit, spun into gear to pass by and smack Bakugou on the side of his neck. FC King Bakugou roared, sparks flaring in a shower of harmless blinding fireworks. He lunged up, a wordless snarl of fury. Ada managed perfect form as he sprinted across the room. Quirks didn't pass along like this, it was unheard of. The only thing like this would be some sort of disease-based quirk. But even then, they always left behind some sort of trace. Oh, Aizawa groaned, a hazy memory flitting in. Oh he knew quirks like these, the DMN annoying ones. You're passing around the quirk, stop it. Aizawa stumbled forward, hip-smacking into a desk. His head snapped forward, his leg stung, he very carefully did not fall. Tag. Shinsu crooned, hand stinging from the hit. Aizawa's neck was flushing a red from the slap. Boldly printed in Shinsu's strike. Oh, Aizawa knew this quirk all right. Get on the bus. Now, Aizawa glared. His students all dejectedly slid onto the yellow contraption, hoisting the bags on their shoulders ever so tightly. It was ridiculous that they had contingency plans like this. Aizawa-sensei, why are we going into quarantine? Midoriya asked politely from the back. Aizawa nearly ground his teeth together. The staff member, blessedly naive, started the bus. Because you are all idiots, Aizawa said, and because you infected me. Like cooties, Mina asked, her eyes sparkling with mirth. Aizawa's knuckles cracked as he curled a fist tightly. No, the quirk you passed along is a two-stage quirk. As you all realized, it is a tactile-based transfer of impulsive action obeying. It's controlled by sound. You all are lucky that Bakugu graciously agreed to carry the quirk until the first stage wears off. All eyes slid down the bus to Bakugu. The teen in question had his eyes closed, thick headphones over his ears. They looked like Gyro's industrial ones, able to cancel all noise. Not only that, but the class already knew distantly that the teen had some sort of hearing reduction he must have after being exposed to the loud explosions for so long. It was odd to see Bakugu not swearing at them all. Although Todoroki's face was swollen from one mighty sucker punch Bakugu landed earlier. It wasn't fair that they were all being lectured and Bakugu was falling asleep in the back like it was a day spa. This quirk is an impulse-based quirk. Aizawa explained. The bus rolled, vibrating along the busy roads. They had a compound a little ways into the forest, enough out of sight in public eye that it would serve as quarantine for now. Not to stop the quirk, it wouldn't be infectious in a few hours. It would be horrible if any of these disaster children's impulsive thoughts managed to find their way to a headline. It could easily ruin their career. This quirk is often misunderstood as a truth-telling quirk. Oh no, Kaminari bemoaned, sliding lower in his seat. I can't tell the truth, Bakugu is gonna kill me. Just power through, Aizawa thought to himself. You have an air mattress and a sleeping bag waiting for you. Power through, we're going to a remote campsite, Aizawa said. No technology, I'm confiscating your phones before we get there. The quirk wears off in 24 hours. I already explained to present Mike the situation and he's handling the owner of the quirk. Everyone gets their own tent. Midoriya nodded and chewed his lip worriedly. Is this going to be like the training camp, sensei? No, Aizawa withheld the urge to sigh. This time, I'm going to make sure every one of you cry. The tents were made well, Bakugu made the tents. Even without being able to hear, he had assembled his tent expertly. Evidently his more vicious student had some sort of experience with camping or hiking. Enough at least. That when he took one look at Todoroki's pile of poles and cloth in the deep consideration on the two-tone's face, Bakugu stomped over in fury. Then he showed up Kaminari's horrible attempts, then Kirishima's, then everyone's, as people cooed and for once took advantage of his deaf state. They made a fire pit, chopped wood, and smoothed the clearing of any dangerously sharp rocks or sticks. Aizawa at least had managed to bring his softest sleeping back, the nice new one made of goose down and warm enough to live in near Arctic conditions. Bakugu took one look at the material and gave a huff of approval. Dinner came around when Aizawa had Shoji and Sato carry all of the food rations set aside from UA for situations such as these. Food was dispersed and cooked in the standardized camping gear. At that time, Aizawa nodded at Bakugu who very slowly and suspiciously removed the earmuffs. The hair around his temple was matted down with sweat. Aizawa mentally apologized to Jairo for her sacrifice. This is how tonight is going to go. Aizawa deadpanned. The cork functions by removing the verbal barrier. When you're asked a question, you're going to say the first thing that comes to mind. This does not necessarily mean it is always true, but generally it is the truth in some form. The effects last for 24 hours, which is why we're isolated out here. I expect you all to remain professional and respectful, although I know you're not going to. Please, do not make Midoriya cry. Midoriya Bok then lowered his eyes, trying not to look like he was indeed going to cry. 
Wait, Bakugu squinted, face set in concentration. This sit is going to make us tell the truth. Impulsive thoughts. Aizawa corrected. Generally only when you are directly addressed. Ashido stood up and set her hands on her hips. Very slowly, she pointed forward, directly at Aizawa himself. The campfire burned. Shadows of L.C. curd. The forest was dark, ominous. Sensei. She trailed off, staring at him earnestly and intently. Who was the last person you embrace? Aizawa couldn't stop himself. He blurted. I gave CPR to a squirrel that fell into a fountain last week. A moment of silence. Oh sit, Shinsu said, calmly, as everyone keeled over trying not to laugh. Kaminari suggested truth or dare, and like fools, they agreed. They had started with actual dares, but then realized that dancing around the subject was horrible, and the blurts were often quite hilarious. The one dare they had managed now housed Todoroki, sprawled contently on his elaborate throne of ice. Takoyami was delighted that Todoroki went so far as to add the gentle snowflake engravings along the arm rests. Everyone else just sat on tree stumps, you know, like normal people. Momo, your rock a bit on her lower lip, her eyes burning in curiosity. What have you made with your quirk that you regret the most? Instantly Momo flinched back, her face blanched. Her hands came close to clutch each other close to her ch sin. She whispered, unable to stop, a pasta noodle that I ate. A pause, then Momo wailed in dismay. You don't understand. It just kept coming, and I kept eating it. I don't know where the noodle ended and where I began where does the noodle end. That's horrifying. Hiroshima beamed. His expression was a juxtaposition to Momo's haunted eyes. The gaunt lines of her face. The sunken horror of defeat. Zero. Have you ever waxed with your tape? Hagakir piped up from across the fire. Still do. Zero grimaced, glancing at his elbows as if they were the things that betrayed him. Takoyami. What's your favorite color? Shoji asked. A rather tame question in comparison to a few. Aizawa still had not recovered from the squirrel. Magenta. Takoyami blinked twice, shrugging one shoulder without care. Why do you wear a mask? For a reason, Shoji said. The group stilled, then glanced at the two. Technically, Shoji had answered the question. The first impulsive answer wasn't the truth, but it was the characteristic traits of personality that spoke. Can anyone here do laundry correctly? Aizawa asked, suffering through it all. A chorus of no's and these machines scare me and I'm banned from the room. Until Bakugu blurted out, yes, the city things don't have the right detergent though. Aizawa's eyebrows rose. Well why didn't you say that instead of making a bomb? It was F.C. King funny. Back you go. Mina leapt in, delighted. How do you not sweat everywhere? Buttocks. Oh get back here you got um raccoon face beach. Koda, Shinsu asked, laying sprawled on the dirt without care under the starlight. Can you control Nezu? No, strange. I tried once and I couldn't either. Shinsu you did what? Tried to control Nezu. He just kept smiling. It was terrifying. Aizawa couldn't help it. He snorted. A low grumpy noise. But over it all, the night dot 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 was fun in its own way. Kaken, Todoroki, have you guys ever tried cooking food with your quirks? Midori asked, soft in the darkness. I'm a biohazard. Bakugu spat out, still a bit annoyed with everything and the unexpected honesty. Todoroki, quietly from the gloom mumbled forlornly. Bacon grease took two years off my life. Yuraka laughed, bright peals of laughter. Bakugu scowled, propping himself up sourly. Oi, Deku, has your mum ever accidentally slapped you with sit from her quirk? Yes, Midori blurted, eyes wide in alarm. I lost three of my baby teeth. No way, three. It was it was different occasions. Mama Midori and no. They kept laughing, grinning as the fire crackled around them. Suyu, what's the worst thing you've ever eaten? Yes, they waited, anticipating more. Suyu didn't, and somehow, somehow, that was answer enough for this blessed disaster of a quirk. Deku, do you always ramble? Gyro asked. I faked it once in middle school to get out of a presentation. Oi, FCK you. FCK that. Deku you're dead do you hear me? Do you hear me? No, Kaken, do you wear eyeliner? And mascara I'm not FC King uncivilized. Hiroshima howled in delight, rolling around on the dirt. They had long since brought out the sleeping bags, slipping inside to stare upwards at the sky. They had all expected things to go downhill, not remain in this weird alignment of relaxing and odd. Bro, Hiroshima asked, nudging Kaminari with his elbow. What's your biggest regret? Kaminari was shuddering and withheld laughter, cosplaying as an electric eel in a public swimming pool. Mina, somewhere across from them, wheezed painfully. Monsur, Todoroki, is all your hair different color? Yes, my legs are prickly. Sato barely managed to sit upright, trying to stop the wide grin on his face. Ayama, how much money do you spend on glitter? Far too much, Mon Amy. Far too much. Okay wait I've got one for everyone. Mina leapt to her feet, nearly tripping over Shinsu's dead form on the ground, who is everyone's favorite hero. Instantly everyone shouted out names and words. Even Aizawa was unable to resist it. Blurting out a name of nostalgia nobody would recognize or remember. Midoriya's cry of all might. 
was deafening Bakugur's equally loud scream nearly caused a sonic boom. Ayama blurted out something in rapid French, but the wide grin on his face spoke of fond memories. Hiroshima shouted out Fakum, Takoyami shyly admitting Hawks. It was quite wholesome, especially as Todoroki sighed dreamily and said whoever takes down Endeavor. Mina tilted her head curiously. Todoroki, you don't like your dad being the number one hero. Todoroki sighed dreamily once more. He'll always be the number one failure to me. Shinsu, on the ground, choked on spit and began to flail. Bakugu surprisingly joined in on the laughter, shakily managing to climb to his feet. He tended to the fire, dragging over some fresh wood to stoke the fire back to life. Oi, Colgate. Bakugu grinned at Todoroki's lifted eyebrows. Rest of your family hate your dad. Todoroki nodded and thought, my gene pool needs a lifeguard. Shinsu barely held it together, howling face first into the dirt. Oh my god, Todoroki you're amazing. Mina crooned in delight. Iraraka, who would you take out? Me. Todoroki blurted instantly. Me. Please. Murder me now. That's not what she meant. Iraraka cackled. Todoroki. Which villain is the hottest? Dabai is on fire. Lord have mercy on me. Jairo cried into Momo's shoulder, both girls vibrating from withheld laughter. Suyu, have you ever gotten hurt with your quirk? Siro asked. I LC get a swing set once. Yes. Aizawa chuckled even, sliding deeper into his sleeping bag. Hagakir, somewhere on his left, sat up abruptly. Though I know. She said. Bakugu, what's Deku's name? No way, he doesn't. Blasty never. He can't. Izuku. Bakugu gritted out, eyes burning slightly. Then, very savagely, the corner of his mouth twisted into something feral. And his mum is the most goddamn badass woman in the world, you hear. No dissing auntie. Well played, Todoroki said, before passing out in his sleeping bag. The quirk wasn't gone by morning, but sunlight had changed everything a little bit. It wasn't that different in comparison to normal. Sure they blurted out answers, but their personality remained behind it all. Todoroki apparently was one crazy cynical maniac, managing to evade almost every question with dark humor. Even Takoyami was shyly sticking near him, dark shadow buzzing with respect. Midoriya was more nervous than normal, buzzing with anxiety. Aizawa was more tired, but Shinsu seemed to have given mercy on the man, considering that he was the one who infected their teacher with one hell of a beach slap. I need coffee, Shinsu said mournfully into the crisp morning air. Coffee is bad for your heart, Momo scolded gently, already scanning through her mind for the proper composition of caffeine. So is reading sappy teenage romance novels, but you will never rid me of this disease. Shinsu deadpanned, the lines under his eyes dark. Todoroki, please, can you knock me unconscious? No, Todoroki didn't even glance over. Then you'll be awake on the ride back and I fully intend to use you as a pillow. You only want me for my body, Shinsu moaned, mouth twisting in amusement. Momo tried not to smile at how fond everyone was with each other. Hey man, Jairo nodded, sliding onto the other nearby stump. You look horrible. Did you sleep at all? No, Shinsu said. I have chronic insomnia. I live on the power of being petty and spite alone. What does Aizawa survive on? Jairo teased. Diet spite, Shinsu said without hesitating for a second. They waited in line, leaning against the empty bus. It was still too early to hop back on. The quirk was fading ever so slightly and only came in intermittent waves. Hey, Shinsu. Siro waved, walking up. Kaminari stopped chattering from where he was running his mouth a mile a minute against the metal edge of the bus. Shinsu, blessedly, had been dozing off. How did you insult Monoma so badly that one time? Siro asked curiously, genuinely open. Shinu's mouth bubbled and before he could stop it, he found himself loudly stating, I have two quirks. Conversation dulled. Many eyes slid over to stare at him. Todoroki in particular looked a bit pained with the confession, knowing the nature of Shinsu's more volatile cruel quirk. Oh, Bakugu asked, nostrils flaring, you holding back on us, prune face. Once again, words bubbled before he could stop. I've never held back against anyone here. Oh, ouch, rude. Midoriya's eyes lit up in excitement. Is it an insult-based quirk? That's so fascinating I had never heard of anything like that before. Is it more of an external factor quirk? Does it have a range? Do you have to wait a set PRD of time before it works, or can you ignore it? Do you know things about Shinsu pressed one finger against his temple with a wince. I inherited it from my mother. Yes, visual-based. Midoriya for the a range of one mile so long as visual contact. Midoriya I have to trigger it. Midoriya sent no. For the love of God. Yuraka placed her hand over Midoriya's mouth, cutting off the ramble instantly. Sorry Shinsu. Midoriya's eyes got big as he realized his mistake. From behind Yuraka's hand, he slurred out dozens and dozens of apologies. Wow, that is CK. Ajiro grimaced, twisting his tail nervously. Sorry about that, Ida, uh, that must have been unsettling. Shinsu shrugged, stretching his jaw. Karma or something like that. Aizawa, Aizawa, Aizawa sensei wake up. Aizawa get up you need to drive the bus. Aizawa, in his sleeping bag, hissed, get up. 
Shinsu moaned. Aizawa. Aizawa. Male parental unit. Please exit the sleeping bag immediately. I hate you. Aizawa slurred from his plush cocoon. So much. Really? No. Shinsu Atoshi was a dot dot dot. He was a unique creature. An obviously welcome addition to the odd community of Class 1A. But he was sometimes dot 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 odd. Standoffish, rude, obtuse and sometimes quite cold. Kaminari was the only student in the class that really could ignore Shinsu's jerk tendencies. Shinsu didn't try, but sometimes his barbs were a bit colder, a bit sharper. Even Yuraka twitched away at some of his vicious but well-meaning hiss over the poorly operating coffee machine. It wasn't Shinsu's fault. Children were constructions built on environments that sometimes were more unstable than others. It didn't mean that it was easier. When Momo passed back an assignment in class and Shinsu startled like a ferocious stray dog, snapping his teeth and curling lips in a bitter exhausted snarl Aizawa sensei only gave her a well-meaning look that transcended words and fortified itself as an apology on Shinsu's behalf. Kirishima once touched Shinsu's shoulder and left the boy spitting slander and blatantly crude remarks where even Bakugu paused to stare at him oddly. A defense mechanism fueled by no quirk, instead burning hot on anger and paranoia. Shinsu was dot 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 he fit in their class well. He contributed like no other, and he was smart. He tried harder than most, even Shoji remarked how intense Shinsu became sometimes. When his face turned calm and determined, with an expression they normally saw just before Midoriya broke every bone in his arm, the standard oh no expression before bodily harm came in the worst way. Except, Shinsu didn't hurt himself. He kept going, far past the level of normal effort with his pure determination to build more muscle and carve away weakness. Only once did the boy outdo Bakugu. Rising earlier and working longer, that particular day ended up with Shinsu falling asleep on his desk and then slumping to the floor snoring. Nobody could outlast Bakugu, although the attempt left him something of a concern risk. Shinsu joined their class not because he passed the entrance exam, but because Minda was expelled. He earned his way into the course, but he was the dot 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 he was the second pick. He wasn't priority choice, and sometimes the look on Shinsu's face told everyone that he hadn't forgotten it. Kaminari was the only one that really managed to break through Shinsu's strange exterior. The odd quirks, the unique little habits and moments of oddity that generally unsettled others. Even Asui confessed on a few occasions that Shinsu's traits and personality bits threw her for a loop. He wasn't someone that she would consider a friend. But he wasn't so unapproachable that he wasn't someone she would never talk to. Kaminari ignored all of this, throwing his arm over Shinsu's shoulders even on the worst days, turning into a human scarf. If Kirishima was the rock needed to stop Bakugu from erupting, Kaminari was the scarf Shinsu used to hide himself from the world. Shinsu didn't leave his room often for study groups preferring to work on his essays or assignments in the privacy of his room. His room, which few people had ever really seen inside. It was a miracle truly. When a knock on the door brought him out of his caffeine-inspired essay that would likely make present Mike cry from the amount of homonyms he was throwing in, Shinsu slowly set down his things, padding quietly over to the door. Shinsu didn't wear slippers, but he did wear thick padded socks that left him silent over the floor. He opened the door quickly before pausing, squinting at the bright light of the hallway with something similar to dread. All assumptions vanished at the sight of his visitor, the least likely person he assumed to see on the other side. Kai, Todoroki said, staring at him blandly. Shinsu blinked quickly, and Todoroki blinked quickly in response. Kai, Shinsu mirrored, feeling very unsure as to what the boy Wayne. Todoroki was fine in academics, so he wasn't there to mooch grades. He also had a completely incompatible fighting style to Shinsu, so he wouldn't want to train in any form. What do you want? Shinsu asked. Noticing only after how curt and rude he sounded, Todoroki squinted slightly, looking over Shinsu's hair into the darkness of his room. Midoriya says you shouldn't work in a dim room, Todoroki said instead of whatever he had come to say. It'll hurt your eyes. Shinsu blinked quickly, not entirely sure what to make of that. I didn't mean to say that. Todoroki tried to quickly fix. I wanted to thank you. Shinsu very pointedly peered up and down the hallway, making sure that nobody was waiting to leap out with a camera, namely Ashido, from what he had heard from Kaminari. Todoroki didn't look that offended. If anything he looked a bit relieved that Shinsu found the exchange equally awkward. For my ass, Todoroki blurted, as if that clarified anything further. It didn't, which made the tension even more awkward. I'll pretend that I didn't hear that. Shinsu offered, wryly smiling as Todoroki slumped in relief. Why are you actually here, pretty boy? You heard Yamomo call me that didn't you? I want to go shopping. Fun, Shinsu said deadpan. Go find Midoriya and knock yourself out. Todoroki looked up and down the hallway himself, making sure that nobody was waiting to jump out and prank him. I want you to go shopping with me, Todoroki clarified weakly. You have, Todoroki, more confusing in reality, used his hands to weakly mimic Shinsu's hair. 
His hair, which was rather desperately in need of a wash and was defying gravity like how Shinsu's brain defied sleep. It was irritating, and somehow was pivotal for Todoroki Shouto to want to take him shopping. I have hair, yes, Shinsu said, squinting as Todoroki looked more distressed. You have hair too. Exactly. Todoroki looked relieved. I have two types of hair. Oh, oh no that was completely new information. All at once, everything made sense and seemed horrible. Shinsu couldn't help the low sound of horror, the low keen of oh. Todoroki nodded, looking distressed. His hair, two different colors, made Shinsu's tired head somehow accept the fact that shopping was now a good idea. You know that I don't really understand style, right? Shinsu warned, opening his door further to fish around for his sweatshirt. Shopping likely meant that he'd have to pay money, which meant that he'd have to find his wallet somewhere in the mess of his room. His room, consisting of the factory-assigned furniture, some peeling wallpaper on one wall when he was high on espresso and wanting to redecorate but had no means to do so, and a couple dozen stuffed animals in various stages of messy. If I wanted style I'd go for Momo, Todoroki said uncomfortably. I have a lot of suits. My father ordered them for his charity functions. Shinsu pulled his favorite sweatshirt over his shoulder, the one with the slight tear on one shoulder that he patched with bright yellow thread that showed through if he stretched too far. Yanking up his hood helped a little, both with hiding his greasy hair and also shading the bright light of the hallway. Todoroki very considerable sidestepped a couple shirts on the floor, mounding in tiny sad lumps that summarized everything Shinsu owned. I don't match my socks. Shinsu warned him. Your sweatshirt has a cat on it, Todoroki said. Shinsu looked at his sweatshirt. So it did, faded and old, but it was a rather nice looking cat. I want a sweatshirt with a cat on it, Todoroki rephrased helpfully. I don't know where to get a sweatshirt with a cat on it. Shinsu scratched his chin, trying to ignore the evidence that he hadn't washed his face recently. Have you tried a thrift store? No, that's why I went to you. Ayama said that you have glitter breathe and I don't know where to find those. Shinsu squinted further. First of all, I don't have glitter breathe, but if I did, would you want some? Yes. Okay then, looks like we're going thrift shopping. Shinsu said, looking down at his thick socks. Do you have money? Would you like some? Todoroki offered. For the first time looking so incredibly uncomfortable, it looked like he was going to walk out and not come back. No, I'm fine. Shinsu said, sighing to close his computer. It was refurbished and cheap and he got it with a few dents along the sides. It ran fine, but it was one of the reasons he didn't like doing homework with other people. Do you know in taxis that can carry our stuff back? Todoroki looked relieved. Can't we carry it? Shinsu snorted and found his phone in a pair of breath that had stains from blueberry along the thigh. I have Aizawa's number. He'll get all happy that I'm out socializing with people and drive us. Come on, there's a few fancy thrift stores that I've wanted to check out but haven't had time. You busy later today? No, I'm free all weekend. Sweet, let's go get some fur shawls. They did not get fur shawls. Todoroki found a fur trench coat, smiled so shyly but happily that Shinsu wished he brought sunglasses because looking at that blinding face hurt. Do you think it brings out my eyes? Todoroki asked, trying to twist in the impractically small mirror on display behind a half dozen scarves hanging from a broken mannequin. Shinsu tilted his head and hummed flatly. The nice flat purple was nice to look at, but with Todoroki's red hair it distracted and washed out the tone of his shirt. If you flip your white hair over, it kinda looks good. Shinsu offered, nibbling on the massive pastry Todoroki had impulsively bought for them. That, and the small cup of coffee that Shinsu had filled almost entirely with espresso shots. It cost a fortune, but Todoroki demanded that he was paying and after that, he fished out a wad of bills and they were on their way. Shinsu wasn't sure if bread was supposed to taste so sweet or if the pure espresso had completely rotted his taste buds. Todoroki frowned in the small mirror and ran his fingers through his hair. The red side was frizzing and curling slightly, while the silky white refused to stay in place. It was a tough world for a two-tone. It doesn't stay, Todoroki said, pouting slightly as his hair slowly slid back into place. Shinsu could argue more, but considering his hair he wasn't sure he had a foot to stand on. What about that? Todoroki pointed to something easily two sizes too large. A big soft-looking sweater with a slightly unraveling shoulder. The stitching wasn't bad. He could easily fix it if he had enough time and patience. It looks nice, Shinsu said, although his voice pitched a bit too high so it came out more like a question. It's big though. Todoroki's eyes turned on him, large and lost in a store filled with second-hand clothing. Is that bad? You are absolutely hopeless, Shinsu said, sighing and shoving his hands into his sweatshirt pocket. Come on, grab it before the store lady thinks we're stealing something. Todoroki looked far too mystified by that idea, and he looked far too casual in the large half-chipped pearls around his neck. The boy had grabbed them like a toddler grabbed unnecessary chip bags in a grocery store, and he refused to part with them. Shinsu, Todoroki paused, eyes widening in delight and fascination. They sell furniture here, 
Yep, Shinsu offered tiredly. Don't buy mattresses because they may have bugs. And pat down cushions for needles but this place is pretty clean so you're fine. Todoroki took two steps towards the side table, one hand extended in awe. His fingertips barely brushed the lamp the weirdly Americanized lamp fashioned in the shape of a woman's leg wearing fishnets and stilettos, with the light bulb emerging from her upper thigh. Todoroki touched it in shock and reverence before he whispered in pure delight my father would hate this. Your room is made to mimic your room at your dad's place, right? Shinsu yawned, sniffing the espresso because he wasn't sure that he could take another sip with how much his tongue hurt and he felt like gagging. Why don't you decorate how you want, instead of just annoying him? Todoroki froze, looking horrified. Shinsu rubbed one eye and sniffled slightly. If you want the lamp then go ahead. Todoroki touched it, tracing the comedic gold with three fingers. He whispered, shaken, dot 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 if dot 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 I want it. You have the emotional range of celery. Shinsu yawned, plopping onto the ground. Shouldn't you buy an actual bed instead of sleeping on your bamboo sticks? Tatami mats. The only mats I know are in my hair. Get a bed you homeless grouch. I need to show you the throw pillow section still. Lots of sequins and get this fake fur, just like ah, what's his name? Anjiro. Anjiro's tail. Todoroki's mouth dropped into a small wordless shape of surprise. Fake fur. There's also a ton of coffee mugs. Shinsu pointed over his shoulder lazily. Really corny crappy ones. You could confuse the hell out of Blasty if you got like, I love vegans, and drank from it every morning. Todoroki's eyes lit up with a fire impossible to ever extinguish. I can love vegans to confuse Bakugo. That's a sacrifice I'm not willing to take. Shinsu confessed. You're braver than any UA graduate. Hero strong. Hoorah. For the school thinking that Todoroki was a pretty boy, he had an incredibly ugly snort, all snotty and disgusting, even when that timid smile of his made his mouth look extra gummy. I want a new scarf, Shinsu summarized plainly. I lost mine the other day. Todoroki looked a bit curious. Why do you want a scarf if you wear a capture weapon like a scarf? You can't wear two scarves. First, how dare you assume I know anything about fashion to not wear two scarves? Second, sometimes I want to wear a scarf inside because it confuses Midoriya. And sometimes, consider this, I am so tired I remind myself to stay awake for the sole purpose of being a jerk. Todoroki looked deep in thought. He nodded very slowly as if Shinsu said something wise. Sometimes, in the middle of the night, I ice down the fire escape instead of stairs if I'm tired. You're a wise man. Shinsu said, can I pay you to ice Bakugu's muscle milk? Or whatever he calls it. No, I want my death to be gaudy. Fair enough. Is this an emergency? Maybe, Shinsu said, I'm socializing. That's like, a red alert in your book isn't it? The last time you socialized my class ended up with unsanitary piercings. This time I only bought, things. A pause on the other end of the phone. Shinsu tapped his foot on the ground. There was a wrapper for junk food stuck in the gutter and he was playing with unwrinkling it as quietly as he could. Todoroki was behind him, lying sprawled on the recently acquired couch that matched absolutely nothing. Did you go shopping unsupervised? No, Shinsu said flatly. He looked at their assortment of merchandise. All of it questionable but eternally satisfying. But I think that Todoroki doesn't count. You went shopping with Todoroki Shadow On your own. Yeah. I need a car because I don't know how to carry the futon. Behind him, Todoroki chimed up just loud enough to be heard over the phone. I think it's a love seat. Shinsu, uncaring of life in general did not hesitate to shout back. That is CRP. If that's a love seat then you're not wearing four sets of pearls. Todoroki was indeed wearing four sets of pearls. On the other side of the phone. Aizawa paused before he very quickly agreed that someone would be arriving with a car shortly to their location. Midnight rolled up in a cute little convertible that looked perfect for her, but looked much better when half of a therapy couch stuck out the back, secured in place by her WHP tied poorly between two chunks of ice, and then buckled in tightly with the seat belt over the top. I think that'll work. Midnight agreed, ignoring how Shinsu was letting Todoroki literally sit on top of him given that there was no space in the back seat. Hang on, boys. We're going home the long way. Isn't it only a 20-minute drive? Todoroki asked into the abyss. The abyss did not answer. Midnight wasn't a horrible driver, but the fact neither boy could wiggle into a seatbelt made the experience that much more terrifying. Any stop sign felt like a car crash when you had a lanky hero in training shifting his bony hips into the sensitive skin of your thigh. Every acceleration felt like mere seconds before death when shoulders jammed into your throat and left you wheezing. If hero training doesn't work for you, Shinsu wheezed, seeing stars from Todoroki's particularly sharp chin bumping into his nose, you can always be a human battering ram. Todoroki looked particularly pleased with that, clutching his four sets of pearls to his CH scent with delight. Midnight didn't take too long. It was easy to notice that the roads she took the small shortcuts were things of habit. Although the teacher was often a source of amusement throughout the school, she was a legitimate teacher and did care for the education and safety of her students. 
Todoroki couldn't imagine any other teacher willing to go so far for anyone else except Aizawa, but it was an open secret the man had never been seen driving. Midnight was an honest woman, but she only came with her golden chariot because Shinsu somehow had become the weird favorite child of the dorm building. Midoriya had already captured All Might in his puppy dog eyes, but Shinsu's eye bags were like deep tar pits and Aizawa was the exhausted saber-toothed tiger waiting to die. That was perhaps a bit too morbid, but Todoroki had seen Shinsu roast his father so a tar pit was accurate. How are you so painful? Shinsu bemoaned. All forms of personal boundaries gone once you had to break into a change room and ate a fellow student in his underwear because he somehow got a sweater stuck on his face. You defy reality. Nobody has a right to be this unbearable. It's in my genes, Todoroki said. Shinsu snorted although the noise was muffled in Todoroki's new ugly sweater. Midnight parked in the back behind the dorm building the special faculty parking lot that was normally empty, mostly because Aizawa driving was like seeing Bakugu having a tea party, and they didn't tend to call the fire department because when Todoroki accidentally set things on fire Momo managed to create something to remedy. In fact, the only time the parking lot was heavily used was when they had to call in the bomb disarmament team to take out Bakugu's dirty laundry. All right boys, Midnight drawled, looking deeply delighted by the array of new cheap eyesores in her car. Do you need help taking this stuff in? We can handle it, but if you want to be a star, you could unload it on the curb. Shinsu offered, already hauling Todoroki off his lap by throwing him over the door instead of opening it like a civilized person. Todoroki flopped over, dropping onto the pavement with a F-wap like a wet towel. No problem. Together, they assembled to disassemble furniture and rearrange their collection like the world's worst garage sale. Nothing matched, nothing was sorted, and above all else, everything was horribly gaudy or out of fashion. Todoroki had never felt so free with his pearls and leopard brie. Midnight didn't laugh, but her lip did twitch at the sight of the woman's leg lamp that Todoroki was sure he would treasure forever. Some of this is actually pretty nice, Midnight noted, running her fingers along a large rolled-up rug. It was good quality, likely donated for the tax deduction instead of actual necessity to get rid of things. I'm almost jealous. Are you jealous of my sweatshirt? Todoroki asked, almost shy. It had been a big step. The boy had shied away for hours over the collection of sweatshirts. Shinsu wasn't sure what sort of repressed trauma was there, but once the two-tone had found a nice comfortable hoodie and tried it on, he overcame his childhood baggage with soaring colors. The sweatshirt wasn't even ridiculous. It was a casual muted gray that looked like it had been washed a bit more than most things. It had the soft near-downy feel to it that only came from age. I am jealous of your sweatshirt, Midnight said. Todoroki ducked his head, looking so touched and delighted he may as well have blushed. This is weird, Shinsu said. Is this weird to anyone else, or is it just me? You're wearing platform shoes, you don't understand the definition of weird. Midnight countered. Sure I do. It has Aizawa's face next to it in the dictionary. Todoroki inhaled, and looked nearly ready to laugh. They began to sort the outfits into the few boxes they had going so far as to jam it into the furniture so they had less things to carry. A dozen shirts in the drawer on the new bedside table. A couple hats stacked carefully on top of the lamp soon they could reasonably carry everything inside with a couple trips. Of course they didn't, because Shinsu was many things but he was lazy above all else when it came to simple pleasures. He stacked everything and hauled the unmanageable mountain of objects while wheezing, midnight watching curiously. Do you need a hand? Midnight offered dryly. I don't need your Shinsu choked, kitten mittens. Midnight rolled her eyes, and Shinsu tripped dropping onto the pavement himself. It looked marginally less painful from when he had thrown Todoroki out of the car. They managed to get everything inside eventually. Small mercies that they had an elevator, and that Todoroki could ice the floor so they could push the mountain like the world's most impractical shipping business known to man. Todoroki learned that Shinsu sounded like a oon with the air slowly let out when he was tired and when he walked into a door frame twice. This is insane, Shinsu moaned, lying sprawled on his sparsely decorated room. This, this effort. Get me my blue hat, it'll hide my tears. You didn't buy a blue hat. Todoroki consoled gently, you bought a blue lava lamp. Shinsu made a low noise, something that could have been dismay although the overall feel to it was a bit more amused. Shinsu's room had been barren, but somewhere along the way it began to fill up, more than physically, although they were getting a bit cramped between the boxes and odd-shaped objects, but the room felt better. Warmer the same way that Todoroki found coffee shops and soba stalls gentle and sweet in the exact antithesis of his family home. It reminded him of his mother's hospital room, sad, but getting happier as time went on. Shinsu placed everything down carefully, gentle fingers with a surprisingly delicate grip. He sorted the clearance objects to the side dirt cheap since they had been in a second-hand store already. Some of the clothing had holes or tears, small imperfections that Shinsu ignored and mentioned offhand he could sew. Todoroki came to the conclusion that the boy could likely paint also, considering one decorative vase was incredibly faded on one side. 
Are you going to get flowers? Todoroki asked. Watching in fascination as Shinsu pulled out a plastic bag filled with oh, actual dirt. He poured the actual dirt into the vase, shaking it around slightly before setting the significantly heavier vase back on the bottom shelf. Flowers won't get light down there, Todoroki said, pointing it out needlessly but feeling compelled to talk anyways. It'll mold if it doesn't get drainage. Since when do you have a green thumb also? Shinsu asked rhetorically. My mother, Todoroki answered, and Shinsu made a blank noise. It didn't mean anything, and Todoroki was thankful for that. You can't tell anyone, Shinsu warned, before he pulled out. A long feather attached to a stick. Without pause, he jammed the stick into the weighted vase and watched the feather drift above the floor. Oh, Todoroki said, and ignored it. His own sense of fashion was odd already enough. They kept sorting, shifting tiny things to the side or into piles. Shinsu grabbed one of Todoroki's purchased hats setting it on top of the Tamen pile. Todoroki took that as a good sign. You never told me why you wanted to go shopping. Shinsu mentioned, sticking a collection of cheap working pens in his mouth. They were fill a bag for a dollar. I don't like my room, Todoroki said. He waited, and Shinsu didn't press further. For that exact reason, Todoroki kept talking. I was afraid my father would visit the dorms. I made my room identical to the one in the family home. Shinsu glanced at him quickly from the corner of his eye, before he said something crude. Todoroki felt the same. Would it be too soon to say that my room was pretty much identical also? Shinsu asked, sounding bitter. The same also, but his room had practically nothing in it oh. I like the painting you bought, Todoroki said, jerking his chin towards the old oil painting that looked boring and standard. A nice river in the country, a handful of pine trees and mountains in the distance. Thanks, Shinsu said, I'm thinking of painting like a swamp monster in the river, or a dragon, or something else weird. They kept unpacking, and for once, Todoroki didn't feel uncomfortable with being quiet the entire time. Todoroki noticed, a few days later, that although Shinsu's room had a makeover he was acting incredibly secretive of the room itself, not allowing anyone in his dorm, and closing the door very quickly. Siro, Shinsu's dorm neighbor, was complaining about it after class, loud and chatting with Ashido who was on Bakugu's other side. The only way for the two to actually hear each other over Bakugu's shouting was to shout louder themselves. Siro, confessing that Shinsu was acting pretty shady and wouldn't let anyone look inside his room. Todoroki didn't understand it they had made Shinsu's room look wonderful. He didn't need to feel uncomfortable about it anymore. Shinsu seemed fine during class sleeping just a bit more than usual. He was as rude and mean as expected. Honestly Todoroki found his personality outright charming after having a heart-to-heart -heart via Midnight's band driving and a seatbelt. Why are you acting so odd? Todoroki asked Shinsu as the latter tried to sneak away once more. Your face is odd. Shinsu blurted without thinking, inhaling sharply once he processed what he said. Oh I didn't. Todoroki tilted his head slightly. That's fair. Why have you been hiding in your room? Shinsu stared back. Nostrils flaring slightly. I have Ashinsu blurted, once again failing to speak reasonably. Polio. Todoroki blinked. And that summarized his day quite nicely. Shinsu's life came to an end one fateful morning, when his door was kicked in by an aggressive foot. Said aggressive foot was attached to an aggressive individual. Shinsu yelped a sound, fell from his precarious position on one foot, and lay sprawled on his floor. Bakugu Katsuki, looking annoyed and inexplicably damp, stomped in. The force of his kick resulted in the door bouncing before CLC King shut again, leaving nobody to witness Shinsu's imminent death. My door. Shinsu whined slowly. That's all you have to say. Get off the floor you got em purple-haired prune. I'm going to kick your face harder than your FC King door. Shinsu didn't stall. He responded in the exact same whine. My face. Bakugu's jaw CLC cat as he ground his teeth together. Shinsu took a small second to survey the situation. Noticing that the damp Bakugu was actually due to a shower, considering the boy had a towel over one shoulder. Thankfully, he was clothed in a hoodie Shinsu had never seen before. Bakugu's favorite shirt in one hand with a large hole. Can you fix this sit or not? Bakugu snapped, move his shirt in Shinsu's face. You mean like? Shinsu paused in alarm, so it? No I want you to tell it to fix itself yes so it you bsdrd. Touchy. Shinsu sniffed, struggling to a seated position. I mean, what? Bakugu sneered, polio. Ah, Shinsu said, before Bakugu could shout again. They were disrupted by a quiet chuffing noise. Bakugu froze, one hand pulled back as if to punch. Mind freak. Bakugu said very calmly, What is the wet F seeker touching my leg? Shinsu winced. That's a tongue. Don't worry, it's not mine. Bakugu's nostrils flared, as if he could breathe explosions as well. Bakugu slowly looked down, his breathing choked and slightly strained as he came eye to eye to the animal in question. The cat, a big white long-haired cat, tilted its head and stared at him. Bright blue eyes and a cute face. Mind freak. Bakugu said calmly. This is a FC King cat. Shinsu wilted, sighing and nodding quietly. 
Bakugu stared at the cat, his palms crackling. The cat didn't react in the slightest. Dot 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 yeah. Shinsu confessed, she's dot 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 soft. Bakugu squinted at him, then stared at the cat again. His upper lip curled as deep in his throat. He made a noise not unlike a snarl. The cat kept looking at him, before it casually began to groom its long fur. It would be a little monster for hairs. What the FCK is with this? Bakugu asked. The cat looked up, its lower jaw dropped from its recent LC king. Amrawa, the cat screamed, piercingly loud and unfiltered. Bakugu jumped, Shinsu looked even more sheepish. The FCK. Bakugu shouted, why is your goddamn rat so loud? She's trying her best. Shinsu defended sourly, she's deaf. Bakugu froze. The cat LC kid herself again, unknowing of her loud wail. You're telling me. This DMN thing can't hear it's a FC king speaker. She's a good girl. Shinsu huffed angrily. She's a good girl. O4. Bakugu cut off with a harsh inhale. Okay look, you eggplant head freak, fix my FC King shirt. You weren't here at the start or you'd know all this goddamn sit. Go to our teacher and tell him this goddamn squirrel is your accommodation. Don't make me FC King repeat myself. What? Shinsu said, you're helping me. No, you're fixing my FC King shirt. And in turn I'm telling you how to not lose your FC King cat symbol. Shinsu squinted. Was that a pun on crash symbol? Like a drum set. That was horrible. Fix it you FC King freak. Bakugu screeched, or do you only speak FC King deaf? Before Shinsu could argue that that doesn't make any sense, Bakugu jerked his hands into what Shinsu thought at first was a very contorted punch. Then his fingers kept shifting into. Bakugu huffed, satisfied, as he casually swore out Shinsu's dignity with refined sign language. The cat, not understanding what had occurred, offered her max volume in ra. In return, the problem with Bakugu was that he tended to. Well, there were admittedly a lot of problems with Bakugu. The fact he tended to explode at everyone. The fact he liked to take scissors to horrible clothing and render them impossible to wear. The fact he woke up far too early, made ridiculous noise in the kitchen, and then refused to share. The only person able to truly tame Bakugo was Kirishima and only through admittedly having his shoes stabbed with scissors while he was wearing them. The duct tape made them look more vintage. Bakugo tended to get in fights with everyone, either verbal, physical, or metaphorical. This, combined with countless other compounding variables Todoroki didn't want to have to explain, left Class 1A in a rather unique and awkward predicament, a predicament best summarized as Bakugu's BSDRD battle. This is absolutely horrible, Mina bemoaned, laying sprawled across the coffee table. The posture didn't seem comfortable, but the pink girl managed to crack her spine in multiple locations. Clearly, there was a purpose. I'm not going to lie, this is actually really funny, Kaminari contributed. Todoroki also thought it was funny, which emphasized how horrible their predicament was. Okay look, we can do this. Mina cheered. She leaped to her feet, pinwheeling her arms to stay balanced before striking a dramatic pose. All we need is someone who can lay some sick beats and in a hole. We are not getting Monoma. I didn't mean Monoma. Mina hissed. I am surrounded by children. Wow, I didn't think Ishido would get so wound up over this. Midoriya muttered from where he was seeking shelter near the repaired floor to ceiling height window. Yuraka watched Mina's vigorous fist pumping with clear fascination. I've never seen her like this before. Yuraka agreed. She's like a whole new person. Hagakure. One to always take advantage of sneaking up on unknowing fools chirped. Not really. Midoriya only squeaked whereas Yuraka made a dramatic yelp akin to a dog falling over. Hagakure politely ignored it. Mina gets like this only when her popularity comes into question. She's the most popular with social media presence here for the hero students. Going up against Shikesu High School is against her pride. And ego. Kaminari shouted from across the room. Most popular, huh? Yuraka blinked. Who is most popular at Shikesu then? Across the room, Mina raised one fist to the air and shrieked. Kami. Okay so, this is the plan. Mina declared in class, commandeering Aizawa's desk for the greater good. We need to destroy Shikesu because someone was an idiot and challenged them to a rap battle without preparing first. Kirishima glanced at Bakugu, who was reclining in his seat and ignoring the world. Kirishima shifted and said, You'll have to talk louder, he has his eyes closed. I know that. I can see that. You need to calm down, Mina, Gyro said, lifting both hands worriedly. Yeah, I've got us covered on the music. Blasty could likely throw in some insults. Todoroki stood. The classroom fell quiet. All students parted before him as he walked very slowly towards the front of the room. A hush descended. The clouds parted and as if an angel had blessed them all Todoroki said, Shinsu, you do it. Oh come on. Shinsu moaned from the back of the room. Why do I need to roast everyone for you idiots? You'll have to speak up. Bakugu has his eyes closed. Kirishima offered helpfully. Okay okay wait. Mina shrieked, pointing across the room. We need to test this. Shinsu, roast Kirishima. Shinsu groaned. He straightened from his slouch, cracking his neck in no less than two places. 
With half a yawn, he managed to say, You are a waste of perfectly good skin that a burn victim could use. Yeah, said Todoroki. Okay, that's valid and fair. Shinsu you're on the squad. No, Shinsu moaned, letting his head drop back down. I don't want to be on the squad. It's okay, Todoroki consoled flatly. It could be worse. Midoriya could be coming for your friendship. Midoriya squawked, blushed, and scrambled to defend himself. Shoji, with all his ears, couldn't decipher what exactly the boy was saying. Are we getting class credit for this? Momo asked. Don't worry, we totally are. Mina soothed. Actually, we're going to film this and use it as a popularity booster to both of the schools. We've got full support and a secret weapon. What secret weapon could we possibly have? Ajiro asked, looking more than a little skeptic. On cue, the door swung open. Nobody had really bothered to wonder where Aizawa sensei had been during what clearly was class time. Their answer arrived in too many sagging chains. A backward base cap secured to a mohawk via duct tape and hairpins, and a loud yo class 1A. Oh, Momo said, sinking into her seat. Shinsu compassionately slid over one of his add up sweatshirts, forming a makeshift pillow for the girl. Momo accepted it gratefully. Takoyami, present Mike shrieked, give me some record scratching. Takoyami made some sort of unholy noise, like that of a cat being dragged across a window via its claws. Present Mike beamed, shrieking out a rattling yeah. Bakugu opened one eye, baffled by the vibrations. He reached to turn on his hearing aid dot 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 and Kirishima very casually pushed his arm back down. Some things, he would spare his friend from hearing. You know, considering that Bakugu got us into a rap battle, he seems really calm about it. Jairo pointed out, throwing one thumb over her shoulder in the direction of the courtyard. He's been getting really zen lately, Siro said with a huff. He used to be so much more fun. Did someone make him go to anger management or something? No. From inside the kitchen, Todoroki emerged. He carried a lime green mug with two chopsticks sticking out of it. He wore, what Jairo would call, a thing. What is that? Siro said. Clearly he was staring at the four severed cat stuffed animal heads sewn to the front of the sweater. From over Todoroki's shoulders, two tails could be seen. The animals had been grafted into the sweater. Todoroki looked down, poking with his chopsticks. I made soba. Right, soba, Jairo said. And your shirt. It's a sweater. Siro calmly peeled a small portion of tape out of his elbow and placed it over his eyes. Okay, Todoroki said, ignoring the action for what it was. He took a careful seat nearby them, peering out of the window he had previously broken many weeks ago. Oh, he's doing yoga. He's a bendy boy, Jairo noted. He's our bendy boy. I thought I was our bendy boy, Siro mumbled sourly, fiddling his tape. Unless he took it off carefully, he would lose his eyebrows. Well, you are oh my god. Is Bakugu oh my god? Even Todoroki balked, paling as he stared out the window. Bakugu slowly shifted himself through a series of very smooth movements, reversing his hip until his feet faced two entirely different ways. Then, like a circus contortionist, Bakugu folded in half. All might have mercy on our souls. Jairo breathed in awe and horror. That boy can touch his toes. No man has a right to touch his toes. Not even a Jiro. Bakugu slid from one pose into the next, slumping into a gentle butterfly that then became not gentle as he pushed the limits of human flexibility and landed somewhere near oh hell no. Okay, this is too much. Someone, please. Get Momo. I want to join. You want to join. Siro balked, finally peeling the tape off his eyes. I would rip myself in half. Mama didn't raise no quitter, Jairo said. This looks fun. Look at him. His eyes are closed. He hasn't looked at us yet so clearly he can't hear us. Let's just dot 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 grab some yoga mats and join him. Todoroki, please have some common sense here, Siro begged. Todoroki scrunched his two different colored brows. He placed his soba coffee cup on the table between them. Absent-mindedly stroking the severed cat plushy head adhered somewhere by his left side ninth rib. I can resist everything except temptation. That was from another one of your goddamn books wasn't it? Siro said. It was. It was you. Todoroki slurped soba pointedly. And from there, the madness began. Momo joined and agreed them instantly, recruiting Asui to help her with depositing the yoga mats. It took no longer than four minutes before Ajiro and Hagakir stumbled upon them, then hastily agreed. Tiptoeing outside around the blind and deaf Bakugu, they began to roll out the mats not more than ten feet behind him. This is our best idea yet, Siro admitted grudgingly, trying to touch his toes all the while watching Bakugu move like a graceful swan. A graceful, explosive, blind swan, with the same temperament. It is fun, Asui agreed, her tongue lolling out as she stretched and cracked something. The problem with the courtyard was that the majority of the building had a clear vantage point to look down and see the suspicious activity. Takoyami slipped out, choosing to read his book in the shadow of a tree while Sato worked on water run. Todoroki revealed his great flexibility, 
looking quite smug when he managed to almost get past his knee level when attempting to touch his toes. Ida of course instantly came out and tried to stop the activities which didn't last because, at this point, Midoriya saw the spectacle and was so moved by Kaken's gentle kind soul appearing, he cried, all over the ground. And then Kirishima snuck out and nearly body tackled Ada out of the way while Bakugu hummed to himself and moved into warrior pose. Oh, oh no, Siro whispered, his thighs trembling under the effort I can't do this. Wimp, Todoroki muttered, barely managing to make his legs straighten. Shinsu sat calmly along the side of the courtyard, seemingly transfixed by what appeared to be a cantaloupe. Why aren't you doing this? Siro hissed to Shinsu. The purple-haired boy slowly looked up, eyes glazed in red. The bags under his eyes were so vivid, they could have been designer brand. With the rabid viciousness of a raccoon, Shinsu spat, namast. Momo tried valiantly, to not giggle. Bakugu led them unknowingly through nearly an hour of yoga, the bane of few, while a nice relaxing joint effort by others. Ajiro looked particularly pleased, even Sato seemed delighted that his homemade tea could help so many. Bakugu of course still hadn't opened his eyes. This was so much fun. Yuraraka squealed, flinging her arms around a ridiculously bendy Asui who knew that Bakugo was a yoga MSDR. Kaken has always been really flexible. Midoriya stumbled. He, he needs to loosen his shoulders a lot so he can coordinate his blasts. <laughs> Bakugo slowly opened his eyes. He stared, a bit baffled at the sight of the entire class. The entire class tensed, ready to bolt. Shinsu snickered from the sidelines, offering a wave and a nice slice of melon. Boy, Blasty, I don't have the hots for you, but I sure love a man that's bendy. Bakugo didn't even react. He blinked twice before shouting back. Get FC Ked, you cantankerous overgrown hydrangea. Boy, Shinsu grinned lazily. Shut your mouth when you're talking to me. Oh wait, that was a good one. Hagakir cheered from somewhere. You guys should work on the rap. But, consider this. Shinsu pointed out, pointing with the melon slice. It may be a bit of a stretch, so stay with me. Consider this. I don't. Ha, huh? Todoroki said, looking a bit amused. We are going to lose so badly. Mina moaned. No, we aren't. Hagakir said, stomping quietly although nobody could see it. Why? Because I am here. Where though? Shinsu commented from the side. Like, where exactly are you? I need to know so I can throw this at you and make an impact. It turned out that Hagakir was a rap goddess. All right, game plan. Hagakir said, delighting in the silk boxing robe thrown over her shoulders. Jairo walked in a determined stomp to her right. Shinsu and Bakugu both flanking on her left. Aizawa, looking far too deranged and strangely pleased for the impending event, chaperoned and walked a safe distance behind them. We've got Mina and the rest of the class waiting in the stands. How did we even get a practice field with stands? That's not important, Gyro. Hagakir shrieked, hopping twice. The little robe fluttered slightly with the movements. Someone, rub my shoulders. No, Bakugu deadpanned. All right, valid. Gyro, run through the beat once more. Gyro balked, looking a bit perplexed. A dot dot it's a dot 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 beat. Boom dot 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 done. Did your mot? Shinsu went cross-eyed, staring at the invisible hand pressing over his mouth. Hush, my child. Hagakir whispered. Save your strength. Okay so uh, we've got the insults and roasts down, Gyro said, looking a bit worried. Are you sure you can handle the rest? Yes, Hagakir said flatly. Shinsu, there she is. Shinsu squinted, sighing dramatically the moment he caught sight. Aizawa stumbled off somewhere, either to chat with the other high school chaperone or sleep under the stands. Kami stood, bouncing on her feet, standard in her uniform, looking far too dazed and dreamy to ever be a threat. Don't fall for it, Bakugu warned in a dark voice. She'll eat your FC King Pancreas. Shinsu, Hagakir barked. Roast her, give me ammunition. Shinsu jolted, grimacing once before nodding jerkily. He started mumbling to himself, being careful to keep his voice quiet. It was the only way he had agreed to help at all not everyone deserved to be brutally exposed the way Shinsu could. A few seconds then Shinsu flinched with a wince, mumbling out a quiet, makeup. Go for the makeup, Bakugu, Hagakir ordered. Like clockwork, Bakugu managed a lazy burn. Tell her that even though girls these days don't need to wear sit on their face, that only applies to actually pretty girls. A small gasp. Gyro mumbled, savage. All right, we're ready, Hagakir said. Yo, Kami, let's throw down. Kami looked up, blinking dazed before giving a small wave. Oh hi, you're like, ready to be burned. You tea because I'm spilling you, babe. Oh sit, Gyro gasped. She's good. Oh you ready, girl? Hagakir roared, leaping into the ring. Gyro, give us the beat. Kami beamed, one hand poking her cheek as she nodded to the beat. I like, totally thought I was gonna be slaying puppy fru fru but mk. Let's do it, hun. Oh god, they were ruined. So like, Kami said, nodding along casually. So, I'm like, the baddest beach here just like that hero bunny. Trying to burn my looks but I ain't thick I straight up dummy. Oh sit, Gyro winced. 
already knowing chaos was going to hit. You show up with your crew because you afraid to take me solo? Kami giggled. Don't worry about that burn honey. Here let me grab you but some aloe. Oh snap, Hagakir said. Hold up one minute, I need you to pay attention. It may be said to mention this is a bit above your comprehension. We're in a new section of limited discretion, where your looks in your possession are a bit of common question. Kami gasped, one hand flying to her mouth. Oh, ho oh, you did not. I went there. Hagakir shrieked. I went there. Word. Bakugo shared an equally baffled expression with Shinsu. Somewhere in the audience, Aizawa was cackling madly. All right there honey, just you hold on a second. Kami spat. You sour up a room just like a rotten lemon. Just take your seat cutie, don't worry if you fit. Cause you're the smock and tea and I'm about to spill it. When do I get to insult you? Bakugo deadpanned. Kami paused, then deflated. But like, cutie you do that all the time. I wanted to like, insult you in style. Style. Bakugo deadpanned. That's what you're calling this. Kami huffed. Iamic pentameter, beach. Ha, huh? okay she got you there. Shinsu snorted. Kami blinked twice, squinting at Shinsu. She cc at her head, putting both hands on her waist as she walked right up into Shinsu's space. Do I like, know you? Kami hummed, reaching out to poke one of Shinsu's impressive eye backs. Oh, worm. These are like, better than Gucci. I love your crippling agony of existence. Shinsu squinted. I can't tell if you're making fun of me. Or if you and I will be very good friends. Wah. Kami giggled. No no, don't worry bro Filoni. You're like, cuter than beans. Bullshit. Shinsu snapped, slapping her hand aside. Cat beans. Cat beans. Don't you talk to me, or my son, or my son's son. Kami hummed, to Stoney's. Pizza roll. Shinsu shrieked, leaping forward like a monster possessed. Kami issued an equal battle cry, accepting the tackle as the two smashed to the ground in a flurry of limbs. This was a bad idea, Gyro sighed. Funny, but a bad idea. True. Hagakure sighed. Bakugu. Bakugu stared at the sky with a suffering expression. What the FCK is the deal with pizza rolls? Worm, Hagakure said. Course syllabus existed as the legal representation for all assignments and work expected within a given topic, normally applied to academic studies. Any syllabus was a carefully printed document detailing the precise days in which to crave death. Some students would immediately highlight all dates written down, making sure that assignments and exams were documented well in advance. In the first week of classes, they would construct a rough timetable and configure their schedule to the allotted amount of study time per week. Some students, like the majority, like to pretend that exams were a myth and wouldn't come for their firstborn in the middle of the night. As exam season approached, rolling through the fog with a sadistic sort of dread, the class split into three categories. The achievers, who had long since known and recognized that eventually, exams would appear on the horizon. They had no worries, no stress or fear in this time of crisis. They had known all along. The performers, who were anxious but accepting that they would likely perform adequately. They did not enjoy the process, but knew how to take the danger in stride. Then, there were the screamers, who had no concept of time and felt closer to death than ever before. It wasn't difficult to guess who was what. I'm not saying that I think you're wrong, Mina argued. She held one pencil between two fingers, using it for limp emphasis with every shift in her tone. I'm just saying I don't think you're right. That's basically saying that I'm wrong, said Kaminari. The poor boy looked horrible. His hair a bit greasy although it lifted vertically with the unfounded powers of static cling. Just because you phrase it like that doesn't make it hurt less. Mina frowned. I don't think there's any science to support that. We are literally studying science right now. Mina squinted at her paper, covered with enough eraser shavings to be a sneezing hazard. I understand your words, but this looks more like math to me. Kaminari moaned and let his forehead slump onto his chemistry textbook. All I'm saying is that maybe if you knew chemistry better, you could like dot 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 make your goo more. Slime, Mina looked at Kaminari with something akin to exhaustion. Oh wow, exactly what I want. Slime, people have paid money for slime before. People have also paid for pictures of feet, Kaminari, Mina argued. That doesn't mean it's a good idea. Kaminari rolled his eyes, gnawing on the end of his pencil. The eraser had long since been torn to strips, which forced him to scribble out his wrong answers. Mina's paper was under a sea of eraser scraps and his crinkled under graphite powder. Together, they made a wonderful team. The world's lamest hero. You know, school. Kaminari trailed off quietly. This dot 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 is not fun. Mina giggled. A small shrill noise bordering slightly on hysteria. Oh really? Really? Just now figuring that out. I don't know how you aren't more freaked out by this. I'm losing sleep. My horns are going to fall out. I don't think they can do that, he said. The trick to not caring is remembering I'd rather be eating food. Mina stared at him uncomprehending. Kaminari shifted uncomfortably on his chair and said, This is boring, you know. I do know, this is incredibly boring, but also this is for an exam I'm going to fail. It happens. Mina closed her eyes and exhaled slowly. 
a forced breath as she set her pencil down flat on her paper. It dot 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 okay, well, what if we don't let it happen? Kaminari hadn't ever considered that before. What do you mean? How about we study really strong, she said pained. Then consider this, we perform well. He looked at her. But, if I try and it doesn't work, then, for the love of God are you telling me you've never tried before? He twitched, looking guiltily at his paper. Well, I mean, I it's okay if I do bad because then my grade isn't. Kaminari, how have you never had the light bulb go off? A pause. Yes, that was a joke. Kaminari cringed back, lifting his hands defensively. It's just I know I get bad grades because I'm not trying my best. But you're not trying your best because you're afraid you're not going to do well. Mina argued. Kaminari, you're an idiot. I know. That's the point. Mina slipped off her chair with a newfound determination. Her feet thumped on the floor. Her gait was that of an ancient Amazonian warrior. Kaminari felt terror infect his BLD, leaving him frozen. I'll be right back, she said with a newfound glare and a fierce goal. We're making a study party. If you have self-confidence issues, only one thing can fix that. Kaminari trembled. Nina, what are you going to do? She wrinkled her nose and lifted her chin. I'm going to surround us with self-esteem issues and WHP all you hydrangeas into shape. Hi, she said. My name is Hagakir and I have self-confidence problems. Hi Hagakir, they chorused uncomfortably. She took a seat behind her binder, organized with an obscene amount of tabs and sticky notes. Thank you for introducing yourself, Mina said. Now that we're all on the same page, it's time to get to the problem at hand. We're studying chemistry, or we were because it's really confusing. It's not confusing, Shinsu mumbled into his elbow. He had both knees pulled to his CH scent, arms swamped in a sweater so large it could have fit all might. It's just effort. Kaminari nodded sagely, causing Mina to sigh tiredly. Look, she said. We're all here because you all have problems. True, Todoroki confirmed. But really, if we're all sitting together and hold each other accountable then maybe we can get through the book. Shinsu lifted his head and squinted at her. He frowned, looking thoroughly exhausted. I was taking a nap. You're always taking a nap, Mina accused. That's like, your thing. Todoroki turned to look at him, patting Shinsu's head over his disaster mess of hair. Shinsu sighed again, slumping back into his arms. Let's just work this out please, Mina begged. Look, on the review guide, we need to balance this one question. Just one question. Let's do it. Hagakure chimed, vibrating a bit in her seat. We can finish the worksheet Mina. No, we cannot, you perfectionist. We are going one question at a time or you'll get upset and guilty we didn't do more so hush. Okay, we need to write this chemical equation. Silver nitrate. Does anyone know silver nitrate? Shinsu moaned illegibly into his shirt. Todoroki blinked, saying nothing. Kaminari mimicked the sounds of crickets. I mean, I maybe do. Hagakure said. Silver is a, or. What? No, Shinsu blurted. He emerged from his legs, alarmed and a bit off kilter. No, O is gold. Oh, Hagakure wilted immediately. Think of it like a robbery, suggested Todoroki. If you were a robber, you wouldn't rob silver. You want gold. I, you. Shinsu crooned with a truly horrible accent, smiling slightly as Hagakure started to giggle. Okay so, O is gold. Silver is ag then, Hagakure said, and on the periodic table. Nah, Shinsu lifted his hand and motioned to give him a moment. He proceeded to yawn so wide, Todoroki could see the indent of his molars. They looked like a raisin. Just ignore the periodic table. If it's shiny and cold, just ignore that mess. You can only work your way across for the charges if you think it isn't a metal. Kaminari scratched the back of his neck. Wow Shinsu, you actually know a lot. Yeah, Shinsu agreed. I'm just depressed and have no motivation. Keep talking, I'm studying through you. I'm not arguing. Mina grinned. Okay, so we've got ag. That's either a 3 or a 1 because I get it mixed up with gold. Muggers, Todoroki said in awe. The robbers want more money. The chemistry study group paused, before simultaneously straightening in their genius. More money. More charge. Gold is IU. O is more. O is 3. Hagakure nearly jumped to her feet. Yes, which means silver is ag and it has a positive 1 charge. It's missing an electron. Nitrate is, no three with a negative one charge, whispered the wind of insomnia and exhaustion. It spoke to them like that of a tired Aizawa, oh no clo. Is that another book quote? Wait, wait say that again, Kaminari gasped. He jerked upright, staring at a wall as the light bulbs above them FLC curd ominously. Oh no clo, oh no clo. Todoroki tilted his head curiously, watching as Kaminari descended into complete madness. No, oh my gosh, Shinsu you're a genius. Thank you, Shinsu said before his throat contorted into a horrible burp. The entire movement looked painful and a bit disturbing. The boy handled it well. Oh no Clo, that's the charges they're all negative one. O is O. No is no three. Clo is. The chlorine one. Mina guessed. Oh my gosh, chlorine. CLO. They turned to stare at Shinsu, who only barely recovered from his heartburn. 
The boy swiped at his face, scrubbing sleep goop from his lower eyelashes. His eye bags were looking quite purple today. Do you always study like that? Hagakure demanded excitedly, with little acronyms and hints and things. Yep, Shinsu said. Not like groups. Why not? Nobody wanted to, he said a bit slowly. Jin had had a lot of classes like this. A bit harder too. Microbiology was really rough. Kaminari didn't like how that sounded. Or maybe the careless look on Shinsu's face when he talked about it. You never studied with your classmates back then? No? The newest member to class 1A asked. People don't like me talking. Besides, I'm lazy. Not really study group material. You just helped us out in chemistry. You're like, the best study group material. Shinsu tilted his head. Huh. Kaminari hadn't ever tried to study. He had before back in middle school when grades started to really matter. Sometimes he could manage it, settling in the center of books where he would eventually nod through all his old notes. It left him exhausted, brain buzzing and sore just behind his eyes. He knew he wasn't smart not that he'd call himself stupid but, if Kaminari never tried at grades, even when Aizawa threatened him with expulsion, sure he'd study and try on the quizzes, but he never dot 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 did as good as he could. If he SCD by without trying, then he knew that one day, if he ever did try, he would do amazing. But, if he tried, and smashed his brain into shape and did the best he could and that wasn't enough, well, maybe then he was stupid. He was too terrified to ever apply himself entirely. Because what if his best wasn't good enough? What if he dot 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 wasn't smart enough even with all his abilities? Sometimes he'd sit in front of homework, chewing through it and plugging numbers and use each wrong answer as an assurance. He still had backing, some padding to cushion his comfort a little bit more. He hadn't realized that other people could have similar thoughts like they were always at a handicap. Hagakure burst into tears a few hours into studying when she messed up an equation twice, fumbling with tissues and ink-stained gloves as she scrambled to fix her mistakes, always convinced she had to be perfect, that she couldn't afford a mistake. She had to present herself perfect because nobody would remember her face or smile so her scores had to do it all for her. Todoroki took each error like it was a summary of who he was. He accepted failure as a characteristic of himself, that a mistake in his knowledge was a mistake in himself. He rolled with the punches, he thought a lower grade defined him as being lower. Mina struggled and couldn't comprehend. Sometimes she'd mess up her letters and numbers, swapping them in such a chaotic medley her mathematics were beyond saving. Years became foreign symbols that had no cipher. She read her notes quietly because there were sections even she couldn't understand. Shinsu bothered him because he was smart. The boy didn't seem like it, but he would interrupt their contemplations with fact or knowledge and go back to his vigil. He never brought his notes or books. Kaminari didn't know if he took notes in class even. Are you like? Kaminari paused and gnawed his inner cheek. Are you dot 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 okay? Shinsu looked at him a bit surprised. Hair a mess, fur on his sweater, and face a translucent exhausted sheen. Yeah, I'm fine, Shinsu deflected. A bit cranky. What a lie. You're really smart. Kaminari enthused. Why do you never study in the library? Or the kitchen or? Oh, Shinsu shuffled awkwardly. I don't study. I mean, I do. Sometimes, uh, was he afraid also? Worried how people would look at him? Kaminari knew that Shinsu's mother wasn't the nicest woman, did he have other pressures? Shinsu sighed a heavy sound. I, think, slowly, you were fast when fixing our mistakes, Kaminari wanted to say. Just, he winced a little. I'm, inconsistent. Sometimes I procrastinate a, a lot. Sometimes I'm focused but it's, Shinsu shrugged one shoulder a bit lamely. Aizawa sensei helps sometimes. Is that why you were in the teacher's lounge before? Shinsu FLC curd his eyes to the side, looking around the room for any sort of distraction. A bit. Sometimes I do more if there's people around. I needed to catch up. There's a lot of classes you all had that I didn't. I'm working on it. Kaminari thought about that. Would Aizawa help him? He was sure that the man would be angry if he knew that Kaminari wasn't trying as strong as he could. Sometimes I can't think of anything, Shinsu said quietly. I... Get lost and I can't get back on track. I can't think of ideas. Can't think of how to study or how to lie. Shinsu caught himself quickly, changing topics to something better. You should uh, go check with the others. You all were working on algebra now, right? Kaminari wanted to know what Shinsu was going to say. Yeah, you going to join us? Headache, he said quickly. Maybe later. Kaminari knew that there wasn't going to be a later. Iraraka joined them halfway through the algebra session, pulling out her glitter pens and small whiteboard. This is great. It's fun working with you all. We're a real party, Hagakure said. Thank you for the tips. No problem. Hiroraka beamed. It's what helped me study for the entrance exam. Summarize everything. I hadn't ever thought of it before, but it does help, confessed Mina. Like, writing it out like a book summary. Works. It's great. Hiroraka agreed. How long have you been at this? When was your snack break? Settle down class. Momo teased. She uncapped a dark marker, deciding to write out all her notes with a dark purple ink instead of a pencil. 
After looking at Mina's collection of heavily used erasers, she swapped them out for a collection of crayons and markers. You're discouraging yourself and doubting. If it's wrong, that's okay. Just try again on a new piece of paper. You need to take school genuinely. Momo scolded them all very gently. It may change your whole future. Success in school matters a lot, but it's not about grades. I realized I wanted to be a hero from school. My old teachers inspired me. Momo smiled so wide, her eyes closed and her face lit up. It's important that we do our best, because if we don't try it now, when will we? It's alright however your scores are, but only if you earn them. Mina looked at her paper, frowning a bit at the ink-covered surfaces. You don't mean that it's only because you're good at school. Of course not, Momo clarified. If you never try your best, how would you know what your interests are? If you never apply yourself the best you can, how would you learn about the things you really love? It's not that easy. Mina curled her hands into fists. Her lip trembled slightly, her arms stained purple with marker ink. I keep making stupid mistakes, and everything gets messy and it's only because I'm using markers now that I can actually do this. Momo's face softened. She slid a small stack of plain paper across the table softly, silencing Mina with its gentle rasp. Then take all your notes with a marker. Mina stared at the stack of plain paper, and the thick marker in her fist. But Sensei will. Sensei knows we're all trying the best we can. He won't be upset with you, I promise. Mina took a deep breath and pulled the spiral-bound sketchbook out from her back. The pages were thick and sturdy, strong enough to resist any stray ink from bleeding through the cream fibers. She pulled out her stack of markers, aligning them in order from purple to orange. She waited, nervously vibrating as Aizawa caught sight of her collection. His eyes lingered for a moment. The FLC curved to her new sketchbook, where she had already written the letters for the day's lesson on the top. He's going to tell me to stop coloring, she thought and is going to get mad that I'm not using a pencil. All right class, Aizawa said. Get your paper. Now, no slacking off. He didn't mention it once. Hey man, Kaminari stopped Shinsu in the hallway of the dorms. The other boy already looked ready for a nap. Although the warmth in his skin suggested he could likely deal with some interaction before. Can I ask some, uh, advice? Shinsu looked at him with a strange sort of frown. You realize that Midoriya's room is the other direction, right? If you want a strangely inspiring speech. No, I a dot 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 just some dot 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 tips for grades and stuff. Shinsu blinked once, a slow curl of his eyelids. His eyelashes were black, even though his eyebrows were purple. Kaminari was certain the boy wore mascara. You want tips for school? Kaminari nodded, rubbing the back of his neck. He couldn't comment before Shinsu made a low groaning gurgle and dot 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 sunk. He slid down the wall of the hallway, settling just to the side of the melted plastic strip from when Ida couldn't slow down in time for the elevator, stroking the prickling melted carpet with one hand. Shinsu adjusted himself into a comfortable seated position. Okay, hit me with it. Strong enough to knock me out if you're that motivated? Kaminari stared. Dude, self-deprecating humor is a coping mechanism, said Shinsu. Okay fine, tips. Uh, shift how you think about your grades. Kaminari frowned. Like, I'm a bad student. At CRP, Shinsu blurted like a projectile weapon. With a little struggle, you can and will develop. I don't know, that's a bit too optimistic for me. Oh shut up, Shinsu teased with a small chuckle. Controlling your health is the biggest thing. Eat good meals, I know it's strong. Steal from Bakugo if you need to. Get plenty of sleep that's where I am. Exercise daily but what am I kidding this is the heroics course I missed the days I did nothing. I came here for advice, not for relatable words. Have you? I don't know dot 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 ever put away your technology before study. Have you ever looked to see how Kaken studies? Midoriya asked him over one stressed early dinner. Both he and Todoroki had occupied two of the chairs at the kitchen island and were fretting over the dumpster fire that was the English language. He's really neat and organized. No offense, Midoriya, Kaminari said while holding his cup of hot chocolate a tad tighter. But not everyone can annoy Blasty and get away unscathed. Oh, Midoriya sunk down in his chair. I, yeah, he likes to color code everything. He has lots of highlighters. Kaken used to save up his money so he could get the ones you refill. Hold up, Kaminari said. His brain worked slowly, then much faster once the image started to present itself somewhere in his frontal lobe. You're telling me dot 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 that dot 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 Blasty refills his highlighters? Midoriya nodded cheerily. Yes, Kaminari felt his right eyebrow twitch ever so slightly. The whole setup, with the little syringes and droppers. Kaken is very dedicated. Kaken, Kaminari repeated, the same person who is a bomb expert. Midoriya looked more confused as Kaminari felt the urge to laugh hysterically overwhelm him. He could picture it painfully well Bakugu's fingers stained with fluorescent dye, looking a tad radioactive as he tried to avoid a chemical explosion. Maybe it was fitting that they once called in the bomb squad, just after the first preparatory quiz, where everyone succumbed to stress and suffering. A collection assembled before the main television. The amount of students meant that only a few could have such luxury as the single-position couch. 
We could just ask Shoji to pull the other couch. No, I heard he was taking a nap. We can live with sitting on the floor. Momo was having a wonderful time. Her legs sprawled across the length of the couch, calves forming a pliable barrier that snugly secured both Asui and Yuraka like a seatbelt. Asui had her hair down, one side chronically moving since Yuraka refused to stop braiding and unraveling with twitching fingers. It was ticklish at first the black ends brushing over her legs, but somewhere after the first dramatic plot twist, she forgot. Todoroki was a polite presence, sitting princely on his heels like the hardwood was a tatami mat. Stress had given him a spattering of mountain peak acne just below his jawline it existed only on the left half and matched his scar with equal soreness. Testily, Todoroki had frozen the right side of his face so cold, the acne shriveled up in a way like G.S. shoved in dry ice. Ajiro sat next to him, his tail curled around and out of the way of Todoroki's space heater skin. Jiro was booing at the television. Occasionally her hand would brush Ajiro's tufted tail in her blind search for popcorn. That's a horrible outfit. Jiro critiqued the television. Boo. Go home. She's learning how to walk in heels. Yuraka defended behind muffled laughter. Let her have this. No. I refuse. This is supposed to be a model example for proper romantic movies and I will not stand for these bad decisions. Asui burbled in her throat, smiling wide and calm. I think she doesn't realize how it looks, Ribbit. With those looks she better be colorblind. Gyro shrieked, fishing into her bowl for an entire handful of salted kernels. With a dramatic overhand throw, she chucked the popcorn like a snow. It exploded and fell pathetically to the ground less than an arm's length away. I like it, Todoroki confessed, smiling softly at the television. His precarious taste in fashion was unmatched, rivaled only by Kirishima's infamous footwear and Shinsu's chronic inability to give a shirt. Jiro shuddered, smacking her arm into Ajiro who teasingly pretended to hold her swooning body upright. Momo, kill me, set that abomination on fire. It's a movie, Asui said. You know what they say. Yuraka wailed. Her determination burned. The sudden spike of dread and hesitation silenced the crowd, holding them helpless as she said, Give a man a fire, he's warm for a day. Set a man on fire, he's warm the rest of his life. It was such an irrelevant statement, the entire punchline would have fallen limp to the floor and stayed there. Instead, with the emotional expression of a potted succulent, Todoroki burst his left side into a fire. It was little more than a collection of human sweat-scent candles, but they all shrieked in laughter and mock audacity. Hiroraka thrashed under Momo's legs, repeating to let her loose so she could save them all. Ajiro used his tail to hold Jiro to the ground, who was attempting to persuade Todoroki into torching the television. I will not destroy the television, Todoroki solemnly informed her. Aizawa-sensei forbids it. Yeah, Jiro, Momo teased. We can't wreck the television. It was one time. Jiro wailed. I wanted to see if I. You shoved your ear into the input. We're lucky it still works. I said I'm sorry for earjacking the TV okay. It was one time and I won't do it again. Halfway through the movie, out of the corner of her eye, Yuraka noticed the most peculiar thing. Ajiro shifted subtly, tail twitching slightly in a way that spoke of pure discomfort. At the start of the movie, when seating arrangements were discussed and blankets dispersed, Yuraka remembered clearly how Ajiro had politely refused accepting a pillow. It struck her that the situation was absolutely ridiculous. Ajiro, she whispered quietly under the sobbing confession of the main protagonist, that the love interest's quirk did not define him do you want a pillow. Ajiro's tail twitched slightly, his back tensed and he whispered back equally quiet, No, nothing's wrong. I'm fine. Yuraka recognized that was clearly a lie. She reached down and gave his tail four firm wax and said, Well, that's okay then. It became apparent that Anjiro's tail was asleep, and it was waking up with her physical smacking. Full on pins and needles, worse than any porcupine quirk or peeling Ciro's tape off your legs. A car exploded. A cat yowled in a dumpster. Anjiro clutched his tail contorting at the feeling. He laughed, he screamed, and as the muscles and nerves along his pelvis and spine came alive, he uncontrollably tooted. Todoroki jolted and there flared a small tuft of fire from his wrist. Jiro snorted, choking on popcorn saliva as Ajiro flushed so dark even Momo couldn't stop her cackle. Oh god, Yuraka wheezed, smacking her hands on Momo with sheer glee. Oh my god, I can't I can't breathe. Achako, Asui gasped, your quirk. Momo shrieked, spinning her arms around as all three drifted weightlessly over the couch. Jiro rolled over and p and her fist into the ground as Ajiro experienced the existential agony of a tail being asleep. When Kaminari was younger, when the news covered heroes like All Might and Endeavor and new rookies appeared and vanished, he had a teacher who would walk him to the bus. He remembered his teacher well, even after so many years. Denki couldn't accomplish more than the most basic spark FLC curring between his fingers like lightning bugs. His teacher, Hayashi Sensei, was a nice man who had a nice wife and no children although he taught Denki's class. His window was filled with lima bean sprouts and plastic cups, each planted by Denki's classmates. 
Denki never passed a test with a perfect score. He never remembered his vocabulary words or how the clouds formed when it was cold out. It's alright, Hayashi Sensei told him as they waited to cross the street. You don't need to know everything. Tests don't tell you who you are as a person. Denki remembered arguing, protesting with pudgy hands and anxious eyes. I want to be a hero. I can't be a hero if I don't know my. You can, Hayashi Sensei told him, offering one hand as they crossed the walkway of waiting cars. You know, I wanted to be a hero too when I was your age. Really? Of course. He laughed. But I grew older and I realized I wasn't born to be a hero. I was born to inspire others, to change people, and to never give up even when I faced challenges that seemed near impossible. Hayashi Sensei smiled and swung their arms again. Kaminari so much smaller in his old teacher's grip. I'll look back one day and know I've done my best because I have helped so many people. You can do anything you wish for, Kaminari Denki, but only by being yourself. Don't lose that little spark of yours, it's just what this world needs. Bakugou jumped slightly when three textbooks slammed down at his table, jostling his cup of water and the tepid remnants of green tea. Bakugou squinted, then glared furiously. No, he rejected. Get the hell out of here you got him extra. Kaminari curled his hands into fists, summoned his courage and said, I want to study. Huh, did I stutter? Bakugou demanded. He spoke with the rage of a caged bull, nostrils flaring and red eyes bulging. I said get the hell out of here. I don't want your dumbass. I am serious, Kaminari said. I, I really want to study. For real, Kaminari fumbled, inverting his pockets and showing his empty hands. I left my phone in my room and, and don't have a computer or anything. Look, I'm just using pens too. No erasers. Bakugu looked at him and frowned. The boy looked down, skimming over the textbooks in question chemistry, math, and grammar. The hardest classes at UA. He surveyed the collection of pens Kaminari brought with him and back to the clean notebook paper. Fine, Bakugu said. Don't be an idiot. Don't play stupid. Ah, thanks man. Kaminari wilted in relief, scrambling into the chair. Worriedly, he checked Bakugu's work he was in the middle of an intimidating-looking math problem with more letters than numbers. I don't know how you do it, Kaminari babbled anxiously. You're just so good at so many things. Bakugu snorted abrasively. His eyes could have set things on fire. So could his hands, which were wearing thin gloves like Mina's when she slept. Thin absorptive fabric that would prevent ruined explosive paper. Listen here you got him burnt out car battery, Bakugu growled. I'm sick of your sit, putting no effort into goddamn anything. Running around laughing like this is some some sort of game. Newsflash you broken light bulb. None of this is easy. That's the point. You keep your goddam head up and actually try this sit or I'm going to kick your butt so fast you'll need ponytail to make you a stretcher. Got it. Kaminari nodded meekly, his mouth dry and throat thick. Good, Bakugu said. Don't ever goddam do anything but your best. If you shrug sit off, then people will shrug you off. Here's some FC King highlighters. Read through and underline sit yes right in your book and tell me when you finish a page. You tell me exactly what you read and if you don't remember, you read it again. You got it. The world needs all sorts of minds, Kaminari Denki. You can be a hero, no matter what anyone tells you. You are enough. Yeah, Kaminari said. And for the first time, he believed it. I'm ready. Sometimes heroes had a specific niche, an area where they excelled above all others, either due to sheer skill or strange mutations that gave them an absolutely unfair advantage compared to others. Aizawa wasn't going to point fingers, but he was absolutely pointing all his toes and two thumbs at Gang Orca's shipwreck Tante. What was Eraserhead supposed to do glare at the water? Some heroes learned their niche and stuck to it, finding ways to perform above and beyond preconceptions. Present Mike seemingly struggled in close quarters, but in truth, his quirk resonated so well with surfaces that he was too good in close quarters. Open expanses and clearings were the only safe option but when a building collapsed or the sewer system needed mapping, he was one of the best ones around. Heroic echolocation worked wonders when you were stuck listening to his rambles for nine hours straight. Midnight performed fantastically in small spaces where air circulation was less than stellar. Office buildings, corridors, a school bus filled with young children yet to discover deodorant midnight had that niche claim. Aizawa perfected the art of chaotic buildings and open areas, which felt like a contradiction except with the number of buildings constantly falling down, there were equal amounts of buildings going up. Eraserhead had construction zones city parks, for lack of better terms, his beach. The point of this assignment is to identify your strengths, Aizawa explained flatly, and where your limitations lie. Hagakure presumably gasped, slamming her gloves down on her desk. Guys, guys we need to find a house of mirrors now. A uh, gyro paused and squinted. Why do you need mirrors? Wouldn't you do great and like? Sunshine. Oh, well there's that too. Asui stuck her hand up, ever so polite as her tongue lolled out slightly. Sensei, how are we going to find our limitations? Aizawa withheld a groan and forever wondered why he hadn't expelled any. Reduce the hurt a little bit. 
Give him more free time on the weekends, because we're going to test out each perceived strength. Chances are you'll fail to recognize your own abilities. Midoriya inhaled a ragged noise, hands trembling from the strength of his withheld excitement. Aizawa looked away, waiting until Midoriya's shaking reached cataclysmic proportions before he gave in. Midoriya, Sensei, Midoriya practically shouted, his face flushed in excitement. Are you saying we're going on a trip? The class began whispering. Frantic looks of glee and horror passed over their heads. Mina blanched and sunk in her chair, mumbling please no, I don't want to remember the squirrel incident. Then you shouldn't have asked. Aizawa thought a bit vindictively. It wasn't his fault his children were certified idiots. Yes, we'll either leave to an approved location or synthetically simulate the specified environment. Asui nodded and tilted her head. Sensei, how deep can you make the pool in the USJ? Ribbit, Hiroraka wriggled in delight, eyes nearly glowing. Yes, Shinsu can you show me how to jump off buildings? Shinsu jolted away, slamming his knee into the metal underside of his desk with a muffled keening noise. His nose screwed up, eyes watered momentarily before he offered a shaky thumbs up in Yuraka's direction. Do you know what she asked? Midoriya whispered under his breath. Midoriya, Shinsu wheezed with the afterimages of pain. I have no goddamn clue. I feel like I'm filling out a dating profile. Kaminari moaned. He was somewhere out of view from the kitchen. Only one sock-clad foot seen from the back of the couch. The slightly slurred voice, as well as the angle of his ankle, suggested that the boy had chosen to sit upside down, face first into the couch seat. I feel like you already fill out too many of those, Gyro contributed. You have what? Four. Okay. Ouch, Kaminari said. And second, I have only two but that's because Spark is a pun and I had to sign up just for that reason. Kami, it's only a pun for you. Leave him be, Gyro, Mina teased. He's going through a difficult PRD in his life. He can't decide if he likes walks on the beach or stargazing more. Kaminari made a noise, muffled it maybe, into the seat of the couch. Gyro at least was performing significantly better with the task, already determining that her niche would be anywhere with decent acoustics or vibrating ability. Taking a leaf from Eraserhead's book, she marked down construction zones and steel frameworks. Asui suggested mentioning cargo holds. This is kind of fun if you think about it, Mina said. Her paper had been decorated all over with a pink marker that bled slightly onto her fingers. Like, my niche. I spray acid everywhere and I'm special for that. Yeah you're special, Kaminari slurred before pouting into the upholstery. It's pretty obvious that Sue is putting down aquatic environments, Gyro said. Do you think she has a second plan? What about like dot 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 box? Please don't tell her that. I don't want to crawl through a bog. Guys, what about like, a rave? Kaminari gasped. Guys I would be amazing in a rave. Imagine it. Mina CLC cut her tongue. Sorry, that's Ayama's niche. Jaira muffled one snort before she rolled her eyes. Twirling a pen between her earphone jacks, she tapped her chin and thought. What about Todoroki? You think he's going to pick somewhere warm or cold? It was a fair point. A few people in the class had obvious advantages in certain environments. Ada would be a monster anywhere with a flat surface. Momo was just... Momo. Hagakure settled on anything solid that couldn't show her feet and anything without precipitation that could give her away. Koda though. Koda had never looked more CCKY than now. He told them with casual fingers and signs that he had this assignment down squat. I know that Hagakure is the one that can rap, Mina remarked after that unsettling experience. But Koda feels more like the badass one. It's because he's the literal worm, Gyro said. And that was that. I understand a few of these locations. Todoroki said outside the bulletin board with the addresses and dates, but many of these I do not. Midoriya thought aggressively. One hand curled under his chin, supporting the weight of his brain as it operated vigorously. Todoroki watched him. Fascinated as the mutters increased in ferocity and speed until they were the dull mantra of an engine preparing for liftoff. He carries a heavy burden, Takoyami said. Todoroki surveyed his friend closely. No, I think his head is the normal size. Midoriya snapped his fingers so suddenly, both boys startled away. Takoyami looked a tad dazed, eyes tracking Midoriya's energetic finger wriggling. Todoroki, recognizing the accidental hazard, slowly reached out to bravely lower the wriggling fingers away from eye level. Midoriya blushed and Takoyami breathed a sigh of relief. The hand crusher, saving lives one at a time. The locations are sorted according to risk factor. Midoriya crowed proudly. First we're going to the USJ because it's unlikely we'll all drown. Then we have the meadow because it's the combination of open area and trees oh I can't wait to see how Siro and Shinsu will incorporate that and he speaks in tongues. Takoyami whispered as once more Midoriya mumbled like an engine. We are not ready to hear these sacred words. Todoroki nodded. It's the pre-flight check. Wait a second. Midoriya snapped again, face lighting up as he nearly shrieked. I've got it. We have lift off. Todoroki mumbled. What is it, Midoriya? We're going to the hiking trail last, he said, quite proud of himself. Because it's only likely a few of us will fall off the cliff and die. 
I was not meant to hear these words, Takoyami said. Ajiro, Mina said numbly. My son, my boy. Ajiro blinked, a bit confused. Aren't I older than you? My son, she stressed. What are you wearing? My swimsuit, he asked, looking more worried by the second. Why? What's wrong? What's happened, Ashido? Your tail, my child, she whispered. It's wearing a swim cap. Ajiro looked at his tail, then at Mina with a growing sense of dread. Please don't touch it. I put it in a ponytail and then the cap and you're going to rip out my hair. Mina, leave him be, Kaminari said with a solemn nod. It's a tough life, my man. Class, Aizawa said from a tall lifeguard stand, comfortably decked out with three stolen lounge chair cushions and one midnight sponsored umbrella. He also had a liberal amount of sunscreen along his nose and under his left eye. His right, where his scar creased across his cheekbone, bore bright green aloe vera. For reasons I don't feel like explaining, Kaminari is banned from this exercise. Distantly, Kaminari complained, Oh come on, I changed my mind, Aizawa said. It's because you once cosplayed as an electric eel, and I don't want to swim and save everyone from your mistakes. Huh? Bakugu cackled, somehow looking confident under his thick layer of sunscreen. He looked more cream cheese than man at this point. Stay out of the pool, you broken battery. Kakin, that isn't nice. Well, I ain't nice you city but nerd. Someone, Aizawa muttered from his shaded nest. Throw those two in already. The water of the USJ was sparkling and clean. Asui's niche was just as anyone imagined aquatic environments and obstacles. She took the lead since her environment had already been mapped out ahead of time. A broken shipwreck in the distance served as a nice beacon to take a break and debrief their own abilities. Everyone knew how to swim, although the far trek did seem a bit imposing. Momo distributed life rings and other flotation materials, passing them out with a sympathetic look. Shinsu was looking particularly glum, scratching his exposed upper arm with blunt nails. Yue had supplied outfits and swimsuits accordingly to each student. Not everyone was comfortable wearing the absolute minimum, especially since being professional was still a priority. The girls wore one-piece swimsuits, similar to racing gear. The boys had slightly more customizable options, being allowed to pick from an array and gear up however they'd like. The common approach was the conservative calf-length swimming leggings, giving everyone the appearance of gang orca's slippery thighs. Kirishima, somehow, had hardened curiously and turned his leg hairs into small needles his legs resembled that of a mutated cactus. I hate water, Shinsu grumbled angrily. He selected to wear a swimming shirt as well, lifting high around his neck and along the tops of his shoulders. Out of all of them, only Ayama wore briefs which apparently were a cultural deviation. I'm not excited for it either, Ajiro confessed with a small grimace. The air between those two had always been a bit strained, but somewhere along the line of mutual misery, they grew to like each other. My tail takes forever to dry after. Have you tried shaving? Shinsu offered. Ajiro shuddered, casting a timid look at Siro who proudly showed off his waxed legs. No thanks, not my thing. They managed to the shipwreck, hauling themselves onto its hull with exhausted enthusiasm. A few discoveries were made namely that Ajiro was an adept swimmer once he undulated his tail like a very uncomfortable dolphin. Kirishima was fine until he hardened, then he sank like a rock. Kaminari was banned from partaking. So he was assigned to the small dingy Aizawa cozied himself up in and began the laborious effort of paddling after slowly. Shoji was the true hero of the assignment, capable of spreading the webbing between each limb so that each pull of his arms propelled him forward. He was practically creating a wake that left Mina choking on chlorinated water. Ida was not a competent swimmer. Momo created an inflatable raft after two mistakes in the RBB formation, then hoisted herself and Jairo aboard. Ida declared himself the engine for the watercraft and resigned himself to aggressive kicking. Shinsu became a drowned cat, clawing and spluttering at every nearby flotation device before he sunk his claws into Shoji's back and hauled himself up out of the water. Bakugu couldn't use his quirk as the water diluted his sweat too much, but his shoulders were akin to circus bear on steroids. He practically flew through the water, shrieking every four seconds when he came up for air before submerging once more. Midoriya acted as the very anxious rabbit, doggy paddling aggressively just out of Bakugu's reach. Todoroki squinted at the assignment, frowned, and froze himself a small bridge. Sato and Siro attempted to climb onto the ice, proceeded to break the ice, leaving Todoroki floating off indignantly. This SCK, Shinsu said miserably, collapsed on the deck of the boat. The synthetic sunlight didn't help burn off the chill in his bones. The water hadn't been that cold until a certain a hole decided to make a glacier. I can't feel my legs, Mina moaned miserably, her horns large projectiles now that her hair was matted to her scalp. I don't know how Tsuyu does it. Tsuyu, defying expectations, was playing in the water contently with plastic-weighted rings Momo and Gyro were tossing over the side of the ship. Even Midoriya looked tired. Although Bakugu was steaming off the dampness with uncontrollable firecrackers over his skin. Don't get too close to them, Yuraka warned. I think the chlorine did something to Bomb Boy. 
It's making really weird fumes. Oh no, will Midoriya be alright? Iraraka shrugged one shoulder. He'll be fine. It made my eyes water a little bit. But Deku cries a lot anyways so it should come out fine. They glanced over. True to her words, Midoriya was staring sightlessly at the sky and bawling uncontrollably. The meadow just outside the city was gorgeous. Sparkling sunshine drifted between stalks of grass and wildflowers. The sparse trees reached skywards with healthy branches. It stank slightly of pollen and allergies. And already Gyro was sniffling from hay fever. This is gonna SCK. Gyro grumbled, squinting in the bright sunshine. I swear the sun is trying to kill me. It's giving me a headache. You should fight it, Mina suggested. What? No, it's the sun. I can help, Yuraka said with one hand outstretched. I'll give you a punt. Get your goddamn lima bean fingers away from me now. Momo disguised her giggle behind her hand, already decked out with the sunglasses she thought to bring earlier. Calm down you two. Sensei said we just need to capture the flag. It feels a bit weird that we're doing this though, Gyro grumbled. I can't get a good here on anyone. The ground is like, made up of something weird. It's not solid, it's all wobbly and muddy. Yuraka nodded in thought. Is it? Maybe. Oh I don't know dirt. Gyro stared. A few crickets chirped. I hate you. I hate you so much right now. The grass rustled Mina lifted one hand in a wordless order for silence. The four girls dropped into a crouch, ready to spring as their target emerged from the long grass. It was Shinsu, Didi over Todoroki's shoulder. The two quirk boy looked like he was having an absolutely horrible time. His face was splotchy with the beginnings of a rash. His eyes were red and watery. His hair had burrs, thorns, and the remnants of what appeared to be a flower crown. Looking at Shinsu, it was confirmed he too, was wearing a broken flower crown. Ah, uh, hey there, Gyro greeted, equally miserable. Todoroki gave a nod of solidarity, sniffing pointedly at the nearby flowers. You look a bit, rough. You don't want to go out there, Shinsu warned them in a traumatized whisper. Koda he's dot 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 he's gone rogue. Yuraka gasped, hand lifting to cover her mouth in horror. Todoroki shuddered, eyes closing at the memory. Koda, Momo worried. Is he okay? He and Midoriya teamed up, Shinsu rasped out. Bakugou got Ada to team up for this one thing. The things I have seen, Todoroki said, are horrible. These flowers, they itch. This grass, it itches. Everything itches. Shinsu nodded and explained to the girls, he doesn't get out much apparently. What is that? Todoroki asked in resigned exhaustion. He lifted one hand, becoming towards a butterfly drifting above their heads. Is this a pigeon? That's a butterfly. I know that. Todoroki explained brokenly. It was a rhetorical expression of how tired I am. Bakugou is on Ida's shoulders because his hair is unfair camouflage. Koda recruited a deer, so he and Midoriya are riding it and jousting Bakugou. I know that's a butterfly. I'm just really really exhausted. Wait, hold up there, Gyro balked. Koda is riding a deer. It's a goddamn stag party out there, Shinsu explained. Last I saw, half the class got taken down by one of those two. Absolute stampede. Ada is too fast to stop. Midoriya is throwing punches. Todoroki is allergic to ragweed and I stepped on a mouse. Oh wow, Mina blinked. Then a CK. What about the flag? Yuraka asked optimistically. The deer ate it, Todoroki said. They're just beating each other up now. Even Koda. Bakugu keeps insulting him with sign language. Mina shook her head in disbelief. You haven't tried to stop them. They can't hear me. Shinsu argued. They're too far away or move too fast to respond. I can't do anything. They looked at Todoroki. Who sniffed and said, no. Well, now that is sorted out, Momo said a tad stressed. Gyro, can you help us out? Bakugo was having an absolutely fantastic day, screaming and shrieking. The air smelled like smoke and burning weeds. Deku was getting his face bashed in from repeated impacts. They were jousting, but with their fists. Give it up, Kakin. Deku shouted, BLD dripping from one nostril. The deer's antlers gave a good grip. The only reason he hadn't been knocked off yet. You can't win. Watch me, nerd. Bakugou screamed, Ida gulped anxiously at the sound. Distantly, over the sound of chirping crickets birds, came the low gentle croon of a song impossible to resist. Country roads. Midoriya's mouth opened into a quiet expression of surprise. They couldn't help it nobody could help it. A unanimous decision, all three bellowed, take me home. Then, with the grace of a thousand watermelons falling off the side of a pickup truck, they collapsed bonelessly into raspberry bushes. The deer blinked before walking off in search of greener pastures, rolling around at the speed of sound. Can someone please shut him up? Ciro cackled, repeating the same chorus again as he swung between lamp posts. Absolutely unstoppable. Shinsu was having a fun time as well, looping back and forth with his capture weapon secure. At first, he had taken the assignment seriously. Then he hadn't and now he was contorting around in a cloth sling like an acrobatic performance crossed with a dance. Hiroraka was also having fun, bouncing from building to building while Midoriya chased her. Each leap left him clutching to the side of brickwork, fingers digging sharply into the wall as he squatted like a frog. 
Mina was similarly enjoying herself, racing with Todoroki along the cement roads and over various impromptu jumps. Kirishima attempted to follow but ultimately found his true passion in the form of a broken fire hydrant he and Yama were trying to fix. You wish you were this good. Siro crooned, SWNGNG directly into Shinsu's cloth hammock where they peered over the edge. Instigators, all of them. Hey, Kirishima asked Asui, abandoning the fruitless fight. Ayama wants to know what would happen if he fired his laser into a window. Wouldn't it break, Ribbit? Well, we thought so too. But his laser is light, right? So wouldn't it bounce back like a mirror? It took approximately 14 seconds for the true horror to sink in. Asui and Kirishima turned back screaming but it was too late. Kaminari witnessed the glorious sight. L seeking a broken telephone pole because he could. Ayama readied his laser, aimed, and fired it at a careful angle into one of the windows. The window refracted the light, bouncing it back into the direct path of another window, where it bounced again and again. Shinsu and Siro screamed, falling from the sky as their sling was sliced by not one, but four lasers crisscrossing. Sparkles everywhere. Rainbows of doom as the city lit in a deadly rave. A disco creating the most deadly rave the world had ever known. Everything changed when the laser creation attacked. Only Aizawa, MSDR of death glares could save them, but when Class 1A needed him most, he vanished. Todoroki didn't know how to conventionally ice skate, but for some unexplained reason, he explicitly stated he wanted to go to an ice rink. He wasn't bad. It was a minor adjustment to shift from simply propelling himself along ice fire ice formation. Instead, he was learning how to use his legs to move him, but it was fun. Ayama and Kaminari both were experienced ice skaters who were attempting to teach Hagakira and Asui how to accurately drop into a spin with one leg outstretched. It was impossible to tell if Hagakira was doing her job accurately since she was only one lethally spinning knife on a shoe, but it was a nice thought. Hiroshima, Siro, and Mina were carefully sling shooting each over across the rink, cackling beyond words as they rolled about uncoordinatedly. Bakugu was doing his own thing, skating laps at a frantic pace with music buzzing in his ears. Midoriya was fumbling about like a newborn colt, managing to take out both Shoji and Sato with his limbs. Asui had opted to sit out, snuggled up in Anjiro's side who generously offered his tail to keep her warm. Aizawa well, nobody in the class wanted to mention him, or how Aizawa was the most experienced out of them all on ice. Everyone had been dreading the hiking experience, assuming rightly so that the slow incline would kill them all. The first hour, they were laughing and joking along the steep path of the nearest hiking trail. The third hour, they had fallen silent and began to make the slightest noises of pain and exhaustion. The fifth hour, they reached the summit with creaking bones and gelatinous legs and Shoji had long since passed out from altitude sickness. They weren't even that high, but even with six mouths breathed the students simply lacked what it took to reach the top. Bakugu, of course, was having the absolute time of his life. He displayed exhaustion, but instead of lashing out or complaining he looked relaxed by the strong effort. His clothes swished, his palms crackled near constantly, and his face relaxed into something nearing peace. Nobody wanted to bother the boy because this was a rarity in itself. Midoriya hung back with a knowing smile, fondly gazing as Bakugu climbed up and over boulders and led the way up the trail. The granola bars he demanded everyone put in their bags filled them with energy, although it did nothing to push away the pain of existence. Bakugu is a very enthusiastic hiker. It a wheezed like a deflating oon. He didn't have enough flat territory to use his quirk. Yep, he loves to hike. It helped a lot with training how to accommodate for thinner air, Midoriya explained, although his eyes were dull with the urge to sleep. He's always been like this. Bakugu hopped hopped up over one larger rock to survey the area visibly brightening before he took off like an overgrown cat to investigate something off the trail. By the time the group caught up, he had resumed his spot as leader and was skittering up a rocky path without care for the railing. We were wrong, Kirishima said at the peak of the world, surveying over the city and the sparkling light of their home. Blasty isn't a camel, he's Baku goat. In the wake of the world of specialization, new discoveries changed and rattled the world of heroics. What once seemed to be a profession of dreams and admiration shifted into something more realistic. Rationalized. It wasn't always fame or glory, often it included grim work or horrible outlooks. It wasn't what everyone had believed when they were children, but they had never lost hope that this was what they were made to do. Specialization training only pushed further the point of how close to the real world they were. Asui's natural talent in water and crippling weakness in the cold was soundproof that nobody was unbeatable. Bakugu's unexpected skill and talent for climbing only emphasized the need for diversity. Aizawa's unexplained figure skating prowess told everyone that they were still innocent children, and brain bleach was not a thing. They still had quite a ways to go before any idea of graduation was realistic to dream about. Yet the field of specialization and diversity left each student rattled. In the wake of chaos and stress, the faculty of any major institution always attempted to combat this through various forms of relaxation. 
Some institutions brought in therapy animals to pet and cry on for a few hours. Other facilities delayed class schedules so students could sleep longer and hopefully better. UA was not a normal facility, either due to the fact that only a fraction of the teaching staff had actually credentials and the others were brought in for the sake of convenience to children. But the biggest dividing factor was that their president was a psychotic rodent. I never had to do this, Aizawa sensei said where he had stolen one of the couches on the floor of the one of dorms. I can't offer you any advice. Your advice is normally CRP anyways, Shinsu muttered, angrily twisting a puzzle cube although it failed to see reason. Don't listen to him. I normally don't, Kaminari confessed, stuttering and backtracking heavily under one ominous red eye, I mean I do in class. Okay maybe not yesterday but Mina brought scented markers and there was one that smelled like pomegranates and I'm a slew. Shinsu coughed obviously, chucking his puzzle cube at Kaminari and nailing him soundly in the face. A sloth, sensei, Shinsu recovered on Kaminari's behalf, he's a sloth for pomegranates. Kaminari offered a horror-filled thumbs up, only distantly aware of how close to death he came. Why yes, uh, uh sloth, he's got a sloth problem, Shinsu said passively, like you and squirrels, sensei. Aizawa groaned low and frustrated, that was one time, and we'll never let you live it down, Shinsu informed him cheerily, like the fact you'll have to deal with more idiots in your class tomorrow. Hey, Kaminari protested, NRSNG has puzzle cube bruised face, my dad isn't an idiot, he's really smart. Oh, Shinsu scrambled quickly, well, my mother is an idiot so we can insult her. Absolutely insane. A complete chicken in a tiny shoebox. What does that mean? She's good at ruffling feathers, explained Shinsu. Do you think Indedbor is going to be there? Aizawa frowned. There are forms filled. He isn't permitted to be on the campus. An Indedbor. Kaminari snorted a tiny giggle. One he tried his best to withhold and failed until a single snot bubble ooned from his right nostril and he choked pathetically on his spit. It's because Shinsu wants to shiv him like a pig. Shinsu didn't blink. He said utterly deadpan, oink oink. The ornamental Japanese lilac tree outside the window was in full BLD, letting down creamy white flowers that were objectively appealing, but in truth ended up crumpled and bruised yellow and stirred up coda allergies until even the birds were blessing his choked sneezes. UAS second official parent student day came around on a bright sunny morning, which obviously meant it would go horribly due to the nature foreshadowing of Class 1A's existence. Todoroki was the calmest in class, for once looking almost at peace as various students succumbed to the natural embarrassment of their parents critiquing their clothes, homework, or asking too many ridiculous questions. Oh, look here. Yuraka was slowly sliding down in her chair, looking more and more like she wanted her desk to eat her. Oh, Achako honey, look at that building. I know, she mumbled a tad stressed under her breath. That's the gym. Oh wow, her father said in awe. That's appealing concrete work. Where would they put the rebar to hold that glass? I don't know, Papa, Yuraka said. Her hands FSDNG her fair. Just, just ask Cementos Sensei later. Please, and take a seat. Oh wow, her mother said with stars in her eyes. You hear that dear? A real life hero. We get to talk to a hero. Yuraka looked to the side, glaring with fire in her eyes at Todoroki's very bemused expression. Don't, it's not funny. I think it's funny, Todoroki said simply, watching in delight as Yuraka's father began another cooing praise for the well-placed railing along the sidewalk. Todoroki didn't understand half of what he was saying but found the entire ordeal quite fascinating. Not nearly as interesting, clearly, as Kirishima who was cheering so loudly both his mothers had stepped in as temporary cheerleaders. Only the one resembled him, with sharp teeth and reddish eyes although her pupils were strangely clouded and reflective and her skin tougher with small raised sections like sandpaper or motorcycle armor. His other mother, a cheery bright bombshell blonde with the facial features of someone uncannily familiar. Todoroki thought the one woman was clearly Kirishima's mother what with a hardening quirk of some sort and the serrated teeth, but the other looked entirely different. Adopted somehow. A stepmother, Todoroki, Takoyami said, brushing near his desk with a similar sort of indifference to the class activity. I see you are interested in the amalgamation of chaos here. Todoroki hummed flatly, tilting his head as a woman who looked very much like an adult female Bakugu, proceeded to PND on the head of Bakugu. I like to watch. Takoyami nodded knowingly. A woman over his shoulder smiled and offered her hand to Todoroki shyly. Hello there. It's so wonderful to meet you. I've heard so much about you. Todoroki looked at the hand a tad hesitant. Ah, hello. I'm Akia Takoyami. She introduced herself warmly. This is my husband, Hernabu Takoyami, but please, call us Aki and Herb. Todoroki paused, then looked around subtly for her husband Takoyami's father. Ah, a pleasure to meet you. Takoyami turned slightly, clearly not thinking. Sitting perched on his right shoulder, just out of initial eyesight, was a plump gray bird. Todoroki's words halted. Hanging stiffly on his tongue, he stared, only aware of how rude he was when he attempted and failed to finish his polite greeting, and meet you a key and bird. 
There was a pause where Takoyami stared at Todoroki with an expression so blank. Todoroki wondered if this was the moment of his death. Instead, Aki Takoyami laughed, a sweet sound as she cheerfully beamed at him. Oh, you're so funny. Our son never mentioned that before in his letters, and we know a bit about letters. Todoroki helplessly looked at Takoyami, still with a pigeon on his right shoulder. Ah, he said, eyes a full seekering to the bird and back with a tad of embarrassment. My father is a mailman. The bird, a pigeon mailman, said, Ku, Takoyami's mother. A cheery of sunshine giggled brightly, Oh dear, please, no more jokes. I may break a bone from laughing. Takoyami's pigeon father fluffed his neck and said, Ku. Takoyami flushed red around his cheeks. Father, please. This is too bright for the melancholy of my soul. Todoroki looked back to his left, where Yuraka looked undeniably pleased with herself. Somewhere up front, Bakugou was shrieking something along the lines of I don't FC King know you old hack. His mother, unless Bakugou had a twin that was inexplicably several decades older than him, shrieked in rage and bopped his head once more. Todoroki remembered seeing mine to hit Bakugou harder. You sir FC King manners. Why don't you, you old hag? The two blondes dissolved from insults into wordless shrieks at each other with sharp teeth. Bakugou's father looking slightly embarrassed but also very used to the cage fighting match in front of him. Oh, hello. A new woman said from the doorway, looking a bit worried by all the new faces and family in the door, Mr. Eraserhead, thank you for offering this. It wasn't my decision, Aizawa said, sitting on top of his desk in a slight perch, one step higher than his usual sleeping bag, although not as professional as his normal public appearances. Thank you for. Midoriya slammed his hands on his desk, jerking himself into a standing posture that could barely be seen over the long pink fur of Mina's father's neck. Midoriya gasped a dramatic inhale, eyes sparkling in joy, mom. The lady spun around, one hand lifting to her mouth in joy. Todoroki felt like it was a dramatic reuniting scene from a classic television show Momo liked to watch. Midoriya's mother started to cry, sniffling quietly as she flung out her arms to hug her child. So that's her. Todoroki mused quietly. I know, right. Yoraka said, finally squeezing away from her parents who were in a debate over the benefits of PVC or PVS piping for service centers. It's strong to remember she's the same woman who once gave Deku a concussion from summoning a spoon across the room. Todoroki stiffened, sitting much taller. I forgot about that. I sure didn't. Yoraka beamed, taking advantage of the fact Ida was not present you know what else I didn't forget. No, what? Todoroki asked before he lifted one hand to stop her. Were you aware that Takoyami's father is a bird? Yuraka blinked quickly, mouth closing fast. She clearly had not been aware of that. Oh my, Midoriya's mother said loudly, the tears starting again, Mitsuki, it's been forever. Oh, and Katsuki you've been avoiding dinner for months. Look how tall you are now. If Yuraka had looked like a deer in headlights before, Bakugu looked like a candle placed under an industrial heat lamp on its last legs. He froze, eyes going big before his face contorted through a terrifying grimace. What is he doing? Siro asked Kaminari a bit terrified. I think, Kaminari shuddered, flinching away from the sight, he's trying to smile. Hi auntie, Bakugu croaked out with the bastardized monstrosity on his face. Something broke, likely Aizawa's sanity, as Midoriya's mother rushed across the room and swept Bakugu up in a tight hug. Bakugu was taller than her, so it looked more like he was being squeezed and dragged about as his head and neck flopped about, hands curled into careful fists away from the woman. Oh you're so strong now. The woman cooed, burrowing her face into his collarbone, have you been eating enough? I get so worried over you too you couldn't imagine how scared I was when I saw on the news what happened. It's it's fine mom. Deku scrambled with a high-pitched voice, Kakin and I are fine. All might was, and all might. Midoriya's mother said with a wobbling lower lip and a determined tilt to her eyebrows. She let go of Bakugu, who inexplicably didn't back away at all. He said that you too would be protected and what is this I hear? Did you get a concussion weeks ago? And I wasn't notified. It wasn't a big deal, mom. Midoriya squeaked nervously, lifting his hands quickly. It was a class project and there were quirks swapped and I ended up with Kakens by accident. What? Midoriya's mother gasped. Oh no. Then, she turned on Bakugu. You poor thing, she said, sniffling before sobbing and hugging Bakugu again. I couldn't imagine that stress. At least you weren't hurt. No no I was er. Bakugu grimaced and looked up at the sky suffering. It's fine, auntie and co. The nerd was fine over it, I'm keeping him out of trouble. Yuraka slowly looked at Todoroki, who had long since forgotten the pigeon father of Takoyami. This, Yuraka said, completely serious, is the best thing that I have ever seen. Perhaps the only saving grace for the parents suddenly infiltrating UA was the lack of necessary exercise students had to do, and the ability to see their parents casually mess up at absolutely everything they tend to normally do. Todoroki learned many things that day, like how Mina's father had legit horns and a long furry pink mane and spoke mystically of a tale that Todoroki was only 70% sure wasn't there. 
He had never heard of Mina having a tail. He had never seen Mina's father with a tail. But there was never enough evidence that such a thing didn't or had not existed until he had access to medical reports. He didn't think Sensei would approve of that sort of extracurricular activity. Midoriya's mother, Inko, was an absolutely fantastic human being. Everyone in the class slowly started to fall for her, either because she was a cinnamon roll of a human being, or because when she saw All Might in person, she instantly accused him of not aiding her poor boy due to the acquired concussion, and threw the nearest object at All Might weakly. Unfortunately, All Might allowed the floppy jacket to hit his face, where the accumulated nitroglycerin caught with the power of half a firecracker dredged through Axe body spray and burnt one eyebrow. Inko immediately started crying and apologizing, which then caused Midoriya to start crying, which made Bakugu laugh and Bakugu's mother to smack him with the closest object to her. This was, unfortunately, not a sweatshirt but ended up being a binder ruler that shattered on Bakugu's forehead. Bakugu stared blankly forehead, a tad stunned and mostly perplexed before his mother jumped straight into loving affectionate insults. Then, Todoroki made a mistake. An absolutely horrible regrettable mistake that he would forever look back on sadly and shed a single tear, freeze it for posterity. Then one day sell for a ridiculous price only to find it on the hero market a half decade later with an extra digit after the original price. Todoroki Shouto watched Bakugu suffer, and then he laughed. Although Kirishima's one mother clearly resembled a shark, it was Bakugu's mother who had the scent for BLD and no mercy in her eyes. Todoroki froze, literally, and slowly Bakugu's mother began to smile. Oh hello, she said crooning, Katsuki, why don't you not be a little sit for once and introduce me to your classmates? Bakugu glared at the wall and said, I don't care about the extras. Mitsuki's smile didn't falter. What about the one with two differed colored eyes? Bakugu's glare twisted as he quickly tried to figure out who it was. Then his jaw fell slack in comprehension. Half and half. Oh, no. Oh. Yes oi. Bakugu said, jumping to his feet to slam sparking palms on his desk with a horrible glow in his eyes. Oi you freeze a burn hot pocket. Yuraka inhaled her water, choking distantly and Midoriya offered one look of sympathy. He didn't even shed a tear, the absolute BSDRD. Can I introduce you? Bakugu said with a face more terrifying than the League of Villains leader, one arm around his older, female twin with the same expression, to my old hag of a mother. Hi, Mitsuki said, jerking one hand out sharply. Over along the wall, Inko sighed with a tired sort of apology, offering a quiet, oh dear. Hi, Todoroki said. Nice to meet you. Mitsuki made a flat hum that could have been a growl. Her hands were softer than Momo, suspiciously soft for the hands of a monster. Your Todoroki Shouto. Then, she went for the kill. She leaned forward and said rather calmly, I like your face. Bakugu looked thrilled. What does that even mean? Todoroki floundered, trying to think of any appropriate response. Takoyami, still inexplicably standing nearby contributed to the conversation knowingly, Ku. My name is Mitsuki Bakugu, she said rather redundantly. I'm the management and materials designer of the Yabaraku brand in the Southern District. Todoroki knew that brand. Who didn't know that brand? It wasn't a major one in regards to clothing production or hero costumes. But it was the awkward middle ground in between. The convenient clothing that resembled just a tad too close to hero clothing but not functional, yet still too outrageous for everyday wear. The sort of clothing where chains would be used instead of shoelaces, or where someone's purse would be sewn into the side of breathe or where where giant grenades would be used as bracelets. Oh, Toradoki said, filled with dread. It's nice to meet you. It sure is, Mitsuki said with her dangerous grin. I've seen some of your photo shoots, not bad but clearly incompetent. Yeah, Todoroki agreed. If my father set it up, it was incompetent. Is your father incompetent? Yes, Mitsuki paused, mentally rewinding before getting back to her main point. I'm like your face and your hair. I've seen your work, although you were a toddler but FCK that. My own brat hates modeling but you. Her eyes glimmered and she leaned forward. She didn't smell like burnt sugar, which was what Todoroki had truthfully been expecting. I think you'd look stunning in LTHR straps and spandex. Oi, Bakugu grumbled, on his phone with one hip leaning into Todoroki's desk. They were all unnecessarily clumped together. We're in public, hag. Careful not to sound like a F-seeking child predator. I am not afraid to beat your butt, Mitsuki retorted, fishing around for another ruler. There is no butt beating in my classroom, Aizawa announced from the front of the room, where he was tiredly talking animatedly to a short old lady with very thick glasses. Please save it for later, the insurance deductible for this is very high. You're lucky, Bakugu told Todoroki. Todoroki didn't feel very lucky. Jiru's parents were the sweetest individuals known to man, helping Inko around and telling her the in and out of the music industry. Both of her parents worked on a few different levels of music, one being a radio host and the other working for soundboard editing and management. Kirishima's mother, the blonde ray of sunshine, happily leaped in due to her position as a weather woman. 
Her cheer was infectious, especially when paired with Aoyama's father, a very shy French man who knew very little Japanese but was an experienced mime of all things. Sato's family owned a small bakery, who provided snacks and treats throughout the day. Momo wasn't as happy with the arrangement. Her parents trying their best but frequently invalidated the hero work in favor of other more suitable quirks. Which, ouch, Shoji walked around with one of his hands gently leading his old grandmother who hobbled over cracks in the sidewalk and thanked him each and every time. Ajiro's mother latched right on. Apparently, she ran a gym of some sort for the aging population and could discuss various types of martial arts with Shoji's grandmother. It was quite endearing, especially seeing so many people comfortable once out in the sunshine. A fair distance away, Kirishima was animatedly punching the air interacting with a very shy third year who had both his parents proudly complimenting and coaxing forward both of them. There were tentacles, shark teeth, and one cow hoof in that exchange. And Ko was the running champ, somehow becoming the certified badass of the class parents despite Bakugu's mother literally rolling up her shirt sleeves and demanding to throw down with a rather frazzled hound dog. Overall, a fantastic day. Hey, Shinsu, Midori asked, looking energetic and thrilled. No bone was broken, today was good. You are, okay, I'm going to stop you there, Shinsu said, considering the topic of this entire day. And what everyone has been doing, I know I have no parental figure here. That is the entire point of today. No, I didn't invite my mother. No, my father isn't out of jail. Yes, I asked Aizawa not to be a jerk about it. Anything left? Midoriya stared and his hand dropped limply. I uh, I was going to ask if you wanted an orange. Shinsu looked at Midoriya's hand. That's a tangerine. And, across the outdoor area where parents were welcome to try their best at the physical examination each child did at the start of the year, Aizawa somehow was thrown in a perfect half-circle to slam face first into the ground. Kota made a loud noise of surprise, absolutely gobsmacked. His father, a man with a rocky face and rocky countenance, rumbled low in his dot 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 rock throat. He and Cementos had been in a conversation that sounded like tectonic plates grinding together just prior. Still holding on to Aizawa's ankle, Shoji's grandmother laughed a shrill a hee hee. That's how we do it. Shoji used all six hands to hide his face whilst his grandmother cackled ominously, somehow bending her tiny frail body to once more, WHP Aizawa down like he was a rag doll. You okay, sensei? Hagakure asked worriedly. Her two parents fretted over him. I'm fine, Aizawa wheezed, clearly winded. Oh, don't feel bad about it, you kid, Shoji's grandmother said, reaching out blearily for one of Shoji's hand to help her over. Back in my day, we did that for fun. Please ignore her, senpai, Shoji apologized with a curt bow. She insisted on coming today. Heroes heroes, she said, stomping one foot into the ground dramatically. Back in my day, we just punched people, knocked some sense into them. Shinsu slipped through the crowd, dropping into a crouch near his mentor. Do you feel like you've had some sense knocked into you? Have you seen the light? Aizawa breathed slowly through his nose, trying to get some air back into his lungs. The old woman continued to cackle, beaming at the poor man. Oh, don't feel so bad. I learned all this as a young child. Wow, you must feel so honored sensei. Shinsu snickered, helping the man to his feet. Grandma, don't, Shoji begged, looking very tired. I'm so sorry, sensei. Chia, oh hush you. She cackled, hobbling over to pat Aizawa's knee sympathetically. You should have seen my husband. Ran off with a pack of wolves. I. Aizawa blinked very overwhelmed. I'm sorry. Oh, oh no don't be. She grinned, squinting so wide she couldn't see behind her thick glasses. He's not dead. Been gone 40 years now, chasing trees and shooting lightning. Shoji sighed tiredly. Grandpapa likes getting hit by lightning. And wolves, Sunny. The wolves. And he has a pack of wolves, Shoji explained sufferingly. I've never seen his face once. He isn't dead. Should be. The grandmother sniffed, reading those nasty books. Lost on the road of life. 40 years he's been gone and I've never seen his face. A moment of silence as everyone struggled to understand the uniform what? It's a family thing, Shoji explained weakly, tapping his own mask. Please, don't ask. Is that all might? His grandmother asked, patting Aizawa's leg once more. Sonny, be a good lad and introduce us. I want to shove him in the dirt. Grandma no. Kaminari's father was the most oblivious genius Ida had ever met. The man was brilliant and became so baffled over simplistic things. Ah, thank you. He said with a wide smile that made his mustache crinkle up. I was at a loss there. You are the CEO of the leading battery manufacturer for electric cars in all of Japan. Ida wanted to say and you can't open a carton of milk. The day was winding down, and everything slowly started to descend into hell because everything always did. Asui was leading her parents around, both frog esquire which tended to be common where they grew up in a coastal village. They hopped around, asking fairly valid questions as the tour group walked out near the front entry. There, because of FC King course there was, stood Endeavor, 
He looked around with a slightly wrinkled nose. Two children in front of him that looked just as displeased of him as the class was. Hey, the boy said, waving his hands dramatically before hopping back and forth, looking into the crowd of humans and heroes. Shouto, Shouto where are you? Natsuo, please. Todoroki brushed through, escaping the clingy grip of Mitsuki who had woven some sort of intricate braid out of his hair and over to the opposing side. He didn't know what exactly it was supposed to be, but it looked a bit like an inverse halo, although his red hair was terribly frizzy. Fayumi, Natsuo. Hey there. Natsuo laughed, throwing one arm over Shouto's shoulder before pointedly turning their backs together on Endeavor. Yumi saw the flyer in the trash, so of course I wanted to come by and embarrass you. Todoroki-kun, Midoriya said in delight. Is this your family? Yes, Todoroki said. This is my elder brother Natsuo and my older sister Fayumi. Midoriya sunk into a bow, hurriedly greeting them with the highest respect. Shinsu instead slunk away, twisting back and forth between people like a boneless greasy cat. Oh wow, you really did get the CRP jeans. Natsuo choked on an unexpected laugh, looking fairly surprised. Uh, I guess. Who are? Shinsu, he introduced with one rolling shrug of his shoulders. Todoroki was suddenly very aware of the face Shinsu had selected to wear one of his favorite hoodies the threadbare purple one with bright white patch spots and a cat paw on the front. The cat hoodie was nearly a legend at this point. Oh, cool. Natsuo smiled. I don't remember you in the original class roster. I came in late, Shinsu said, squashed a G, took the G's social security number and his identity. That's me now, stinky garbage boy. Hi stinky garbage boy, Todoroki said without thinking. This is my sister, Fayumi. Hey, Shinsu greeted with a short nod. So, not to be a jerk, but why did you bring the Roku in with you? Fayumi gaped and Natsuo choked on his laugh, looking more delighted by the second. Oh, shout do I like him, Shinsu Khan. Midoriya squeaked, looking like he wanted to drag his classmate away. No, please don't call Endeavor-san. Then Shinsu's lazy posture stiffened, freezing so quickly it was jarring. The boy inhaled through suddenly clenched teeth, took three steps backward, and looked ready to run. Aizawa with his acquired sixth sense for Midoriya is going to do something stupid slid out from the sea of students and parents, chatting and enjoying each other on the dusk grounds. Shinsu, migraine. Shinsu shuddered and kept his body angled away carefully. Did they send out FC King flyers? Aizawa frowned slightly, maroon eyes surveying the site before they landed on a potential candidate. Midoriya, please contact Cementos for possible assistance. Cementos, the only one who could realistically SCRT endeavor off the grounds quickly. Midoriya nodded quickly, looking ready to run off. Oh sorry, a new voice said, belonging to a woman that reminded Midoriya a bit of midnight. Tall and lanky, skin a bit waxy with short dark hair brushing along her jaw. She was clutching an unlit cigarette and her rasp indicated she knew how to smoke them. Didn't mean to crash the tea party. Aizawa frowned and said nothing. Endeavor turned, ready to say something and the woman reached out and lit her cigarette on the highest arc of Endeavor's mustache. Thanks, she said with a wide Cheshire grin, puffing smoke from her nostrils. Natuso whispered a quiet word of admiration and the FCK. Midoriya had a very bad feeling. But it was not Aizawa who patented the sixth sense of Midoriya being an idiot. And Ko Midoriya came out from the crowd. Eyes wide and lower lip between her teeth in worry. Mitsuki at her side. Both women were sipping from diet pop, looking relaxed and happy in the summer air. Oh well, the newcomer said, batting her charcoal eyes at the two women. Don't let me hold you up. We were just going, Aizawa said calmly. Midoriya, Todoroki. No, Endeavor said with no room for questions. Shouto stays here. Hey wait, Mitsuki interjected with a slight frown. If he doesn't want to stay here, he doesn't FC King have to. Such crude words, Endeavor said disapprovingly. No wonder your spawn is such a vulgar animal. Inko frowned, and Mitsuki ceased. Inko, hold my pop. No, no, Aizawa interjected, knowing that tone of voice to be the tone just prior to Bakugo applying bodily harm. There will be no violence here. Smart idea, the woman rasped with another smile. Hey, bedbug, let's get going. Shinsu's shoulders hunkered inwards, his teeth grinding together. He took one breath, spun on his heels and glared through the tiny gathering of students and parents and said, Oi, FCKU mom. His mother didn't look upset, she just tilted her head slightly and puffed smoke. Shinsu was shaking slightly. Nah, his mother said after a short moment where everybody could feel the tension. I don't think so. Get over here, Laos. Now, Shinsu said, no. Her expression changed slightly into something a bit angrier and less lazy. Midoriya hated that he could see the similarities, the clear genetics in their faces. Her hair was a similar texture to Shinsu, her body proportions and posture. But Endeavor was also a hero. And although he was angry his duties were being put into question, Endeavor turned to the woman, crossed his arms and said, Ma'am, it is requested you leave the grounds. I advise you to do as such. The woman lifted her eyebrows, puffed on her ember and tilted her head. She said, I don't think so. You're not going to touch me. 
Then she exhaled smoke like mist rolling on the surface of a fountain. Dot 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 or I'll cry wolf and say you attacked me just like you hit that pretty little snowflake of yours. Natsuo swung his head around, hurting Fayumi and Shouto with one hand closer to Aizawa. Already he was prepared to intervene, wishing he had thought to bring his scarves. Endeavor fumed, wordless as Shinsu's mother chuckled two hoarse barks. Nothing, no words, she asked, still smoking and smiling crookedly. Kano, Hawk got your tongue. Oh, seems he's got a bit more than that. You should stop talking, Endeavor said abruptly. Why? The woman asked, I'm not breaking a law. I don't know anything, just call it a hunch. Just spewing smoke here, she said, puffing away. Her eyes gleamed and she said, oh, maybe it's that you don't like. Never did like when someone talked back, breathed back, smoke from fanning someone else. It must have been so easy to put out that little fire. Shinsu shuddered. Aizawa put one hand on his shoulder, muttering low. Get inside, I'll deal with her. She shouldn't be here. I know, I'll fix it. Aizawa promised quietly, hands itching to intervene. Inko hugged Midoriya close, looking at Mitsuki who had a considering sort of frown. Bakugu had emerged from the crowd, rapidly absorbing everything that was happening. Bakugu always had been one of the more observant students. Oi, hag, Bakugu said with a short grunt. Beach over there has headache as sit. Bad insults and all. Mitsuki's nose wrinkled. Considering it's FC King Endeavor, she's roasting him pretty well. Shinsu's mother apparently said something that started something. Because Endeavor stepped back rapidly, putting distance between them quickly with a pale but blank face. The woman was chuckling, looking a tad annoyed, like Shinsu did when someone woke him up to move him to a proper bed instead of a couch. Can't handle that one, she asked, fixing her eyes on the three children who were at a loss. Did your daddy ever say what happened to big old Talia? I wonder what the cost of cremation is. Boy, Mitsuki said, looking only halfway to a feral Bakugu. The racer head, she demanded firmly, hold my pop. Aizawa numbly accepted her kin of pop. Bakugu let loose a whoop, shouting something close to go get that freak. FC King turn her into engine grease. Inko hurried after, looking a bit overwhelmed. Midoriya reached out with one arm, a wordless cry dying on her lips the moment Mitsuki transformed into a loud shrieking banshee of a human being. If I didn't know better, Shinsu said, still shaken, I'd say she's related to present Mike. Worse, Aizawa said, she's related to Bakugu. Todoroki watched, as Shinsu's mother quickly began to look annoyed, then overwhelmed with the ferocity of the insults. Mitsuki kept going, wave after wave of high-tier venom. Oh shut it you greasy-faced beach, Shinsu's mother rumbled, unable to gather her wits long enough to get a good insult in. Is that all you've got? Mitsuki hissed, somehow towering over her despite the shorter height. I'm in the fashion industry, I was a model. You're just walking in Faisma on your last laugh. Shinsu's mother bit into her cigarette, spilling unburned tobacco onto the sidewalk. You may have a cute quirk, but in the end, you're still blowing sit, Mitsuki hissed. You don't have half of what it takes. You may have a kid here, but you sure as FCK aren't a mother. Oh FCK you. Shinsu's mother rasped, finally SWNGNG her right fist clumsily around. Mitsuki didn't even bother dodging. It missed on its own and overshot in front of Shinsu's mother's face. Then, it jerked backward and smacked solidly into her own skull with enough force to send her to the ground unconscious. A lucky shot had Hagakir come in and slammed her fist so strong the rebound knocked her out. No, because Inko was standing there with angry tears and a quivering lip with one hand outstretched, having pushed Shinsu's mother's fist back to hit herself. Don't you ever, Inko swore, hurt one of my babies again. Holy sit, Bakugu said. Auntie, you just knocked her the FCK out. Inko grimaced, looking very worried. I know, I'm so sorry. Oh, I didn't mean for any trouble. Oh gosh. This is such a mess. Aizawa, still dumbfounded, just shook his head wordlessly. Even Endeavor didn't say a word. From behind them, Shinsu was giggling a tad hysterically with tears in his eyes, laughing, Mama Midoriya, yes. 